Good evening and welcome to the City of Boynton Beach City Commission meeting today, Tuesday, October 6, 2020 at 5.33 p.m. John, would you please provide us with an introduction? Yes, hello and welcome. My name is John McNally and I'll be providing assistance to the mayor and the elected officials during today's meeting. Before we start, I'd like to review a few housekeeping items so the public audience knows how to participate. Your microphones have been muted to reduce background noise during this public meeting. There will be specific times during this meeting when members of the public can ask questions and provide feedback. The first way is by typing their question into the questions section at the bottom of the GoToWebinar interface. Those items will be read into the record by a meeting organizer at the appropriate time. Please be sure to include your name for the record. The second way is by using the GoToWebinar interface and clicking on the raise hand option. A meeting organizer will announce the speaker and unmute their audio, at which time the speaker should state their name for the record. Before speaking, please take steps to minimize any sources of background noise and speak clearly into your device during your allotted time. I will now turn control over to Mayor Stephen Grant, who will be presiding over today's meeting. Thank you, John. Um, would everyone please rise for an invocation led by Commissioner Hay, followed by the Pledge of Allegiance, led by Christina Romulus. And uh, I'll stay seated. Let us pray. Father, we thank you for another beautiful sunny day in South Florida. We pray for those who may be in the path of the hurricane at uh, Category 4. Uh, we pray for the Louisiana area and well as ourselves. We find ourselves gathered here today to make decisions for our community. Uh, may we use our best skills and our judgment, keeping ourselves impartial and neutral as we consider the merits and the pitfalls of each matter that is placed before us today, and always act in accordance with what is best for the city of Boynton Beach and our fellow citizens. Bless now this commission, bless each indiv individually, bless uh, Lori, our city manager and her staff. And we pray for those who uh, this is Domestic Violence Awareness Month. We pray for those who have been victims of domestic violence, and we pray that uh, they will seek and get the help that they need. And now, Father, we ask it all in your Savior's name, we pray, let every heart say amen. Amen. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United uh, States of America, America and to the Republic the for which it stands, one nation, under God, God, indivisible, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you. May I have a roll call, please? Mayor Stephen B. Grant. Present. Vice Mayor Ty Serga. Present. Commissioner Justin Catt. Here. Commissioner Woodrow L. Hay. Here. Christina L. Ramos. Present. Mayor, we have a quorum. Thank you so much. Moving on to agenda approval. I know that uh, we have a request from the city manager to add a new uh, I, an item for new business, uh, transportation to early voting and the city of Boynton Beach. So I'd like to put that under item 11A. All right. Uh, Mayor? Yes. I would like to uh, add uh, possibly 2B on the, uh, right after everybody gives their um, uh, items, acknowledgement for Jim Cheroff to make some comments about the victory that we just received in, the, in an email today uh, concerning the, uh, the city's chronic nuisance ordin ordinance and what it means. If, uh, if that would be in order. All right, um, I'm happy to have an item for 12C under legal. And do you mind if we put that under uh, as a, a, the last announcement? Nope, no okay. problem. So 12C will be um, the uh, circuit court ruling against homing in and we'll hear that as uh, the last announcement. May I yes. like to add uh, 
two things. One, I'd like to add um, the chief just giving a, a brief announcement and explanation as to the um, transparency web page that was created. Um, just would like to talk a little bit about that just so that we could add that under announcements and then um, and under future agenda. Um, so for our next commission meeting, I'd, I'd like to um, have a discussion about the about an EPS foam ordinance that I received that I have Rebecca Harvey looking into. So I'd like to add that under future agenda for next commission meeting to discuss. Okay. Um, May as for, yeah, no, I, before we move on, I just, regarding the, the police report, um, are you okay if we move that to the, the city managers under the city manager's report? Um, because we do have quite a bit, a lot of announcements and proclamations. No worries. Okay, and that way the, the city manager can announce the new deputy chiefs in the fire and police department. All right, Commissioner Katz. I'm sorry, what are you asking? Uh, did you, I, I didn't, I thought you had uh, another comment. Oh, that was No, sir. Okay. Mayor, yeah, that was me. Oh, I'm sorry. Yes. I just wanted to ask uh, Commissioner Romulus, could you just give us like, a little bullet point of what that ordinance was? I just haven't heard of it before. Um, so Rebecca would be sending it out. It, it's just to get um, consensus that for us to have a discussion on it. Um, I received a request to add that um, as an ordinance that the city would follow at our facilities where we would not use styrofoam um stuff but rebecca will be sending it out and putting it on a future agenda um if if the commission is in agreement i okay. thought we already passed that ordinance no there was another plastic based uh ordinance that we had for the city i'm assuming so because if the request is being made i think it's because we don't have anything on the books okay yeah all right is there anything else in regards to tonight's agenda? Okay. No. Nope. All right, hearing none, may I have a motion to approve as amended? So we'll move. Second. Okay. All those in favor, state so by saying aye. 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 All those opposed? Hearing none, motion passes unanimously. Moving on to informational items from the City Commission, Vice Mayor, would you like to begin? I have no informational items. I do want to disclose that I did speak with both parties involved in the Nichols property. Okay. Uh, Commissioner Romulus, do you have anything to disclose? Um, I can't remember, honestly. <laughs> I'm sorry. Um, I, I just, I, I know I spoke to a lot of people. My, my brain is not in the right place right now. I'll, um, I'll be happy to come back to you if you, if you like. Yeah, but I, I don't think I really have any disclosures for tonight's meeting. Okay. Commissioner Hay? Uh, yes, I did speak with, uh, am I on? Yeah, okay. I did speak with Centennial uh, about the, uh, the Nichols property. Um, that's it for me. All right. And Commissioner Katz? Uh, I received phone calls from both Bradley Miller and Centennial regarding the Nichols property with Bradley Miller representing Pulte Group. Mm -hmm. And that's it. Okay. Um, as for myself, I know that some people try to send me a text message uh, during the meeting to get my attention because I may have missed something. Um, the, the phone number that is linked to my watch that I can look for is 561. 501-3783. Um, as for myself, the, the past few weeks, I attended on September 16th, the Business Development Bureau's uh, real estate uh, seminar and a digital inclusion with Quantum Foundation. On September 17th, I attended the Transportation Planning Agency for Palm Beach County meeting, where uh, I moved for the, the agency to have discussions with the county to get better informed of what our neighbors to the south are doing regarding transit stations. 
Um, I believe tonight uh, Miami-Dade uh, County is trying to approve five different commuter transit stations in their uh, county. And so I, I want to get better understanding of where we as the city of Boynton Beach go in between two different train stations coming along in Boca and one currently in West Palm Beach, how we can benefit from the different discussions. Um, on the 18th, I attended the Florida League of Cities and had a uh, conversation regarding downtown development with uh, the Dameda's, uh, Davis Camelier, Harvey Oyer, uh, Mark Heffron, and John Markey. Um, the, the, the summary of that conversation is that everyone is open to new ideas, but not necessarily um, collaborating with one another. And so for my take is that if we want to add some commercial aspects to it, um, the CRA and the city are going to have to ways to subsidize that uh, to help make sure that it is um, reasonable for these developers to develop them. Uh, I wish everyone a, a happy Rosh Hashanah on the 19th and celebrating 5781 for the Jewish New Year. On the 21st, I attended the Literacy Coalition. Um, we have a new Read for the Record book, which I hope the, the commission will do and we'll figure out how to get the, the most people involved like we did last year. Um, and also, the, I read the, the book for uh, the county called The Nickel Boys. I thought it was a great book and I, I'm looking forward to hopefully having a discussion at our library about that book. Um, on the 22nd, I attended the Dune Restoration with the Regional Conservation where we are trying to expand the biodiversity of the flora along the, the dunes. And I was able to plant uh, sea cedars, sea lavenders, palmettos, and it was very nice. Um, on the 25th, I uh, spoke with community partners in regards to the Navigator program. Um, with the, the $75,000 uh, investment that the city is moving forward with the Wi-Fi extenders, my goal is to make sure that we have the capability to educate our population on how to properly use technology. In addition, I would like to, uh, I'm in the works to plan to have a meaningful discussion with Healthier Boynton Beach to help educate our caregivers and caregivee population how to use telemedicine and uh, move forward with that. Uh, on September 28th, uh, it was Yom Kippur, Day of Atonement. Um, and October 1st, I had a conversation regarding Ocean One and their new developments. And today I spoke with Bonnie Miskell. Um, I also spoke with uh, Louis Sweezy uh, for Centennial. And I think that is it for me for informational items. And seeing no more, we will move on. Yes, Commissioner Romulus. Yeah. So my, my only disclosure is that I did speak as well to um, Bradley Miller regarding the Nichols property and I got several emails from others. Yes, awesome. uh, I have received uh, emails regarding the Nichols property as well. And we'll move on to the first of five proclamations. Our first proclamation is for October 15, 2020 is White Cane Safety Day in recognition of the growing independence and self-sufficiency of individuals who are blind in America and also to gain Recognition of the white cane as the symbol of that independence and that self-reliance. Ted Goodenough, Assistant ADA Coordinator, will accept the proclamation. City of Boynton Beach Proclamation. Whereas the white cane, which every blind citizen in, of, in our city has the right to carry, demonstrates and symbolizes the ability to achieve a full and independent life and the capacity to work productively in competitive employment. And whereas the white cane allowing every blind person to move freely and safely from place to place makes it possible for the blind to fully participate in and contribute to our society. And whereas every citizen should be aware that the law requires that motorists exercise appropriate caution when approaching a blind person carrying a white cane or guided by a dog guide. And whereas Florida law also calls upon employers, both public and private, to be aware of and utilize the employment skills of our blind citizens by recognizing their worth as individuals and their productive capacities. And whereas the city of Boynton Beach and our business community with the cooperative assistance of the Lighthouse for the Blind of the Palm Beaches can look forward to a continued expansion of employment opportunities for and greater acceptance of blind persons in the competitive labor market. Now, therefore, I, Stephen B. Grant, Mayor of the City of Boynton Beach, to hereby proclaim October 15, 2020 as White Cane Safety Day. 
in Boyne Beach and call upon our schools, colleges, and universities to offer full opportunities for training to blind persons upon employers and the public to utilize the available skills and competent blind persons and to open new opportunities for the blind in our rapidly changing society and upon all citizens to recognize the white cane as an instrument of safety and self-help for blind pedestrians on our streets and highways today and every day. And uh, do we have, oh, we have Debbie here. Um, thank you, Mayor Grant. And um, Ted Good enough was not feeling well today, so he could not be here, but he looks forward to being with you next year to accept the proclamation. And I just wanted to say thank you on behalf of the Lighthouse for the Blind of the Palm Beaches, our partner, as well as Florida Division of Blind Services. Um, they have certainly supported the city in our efforts, and we appreciate all of our residents and visitors for observing the white cane and also guide dogs. Thank you so much. Our pleasure. Our next proclamation is the week of October 19th to the 25th as Florida City Government Week. Vice Mayor Pinsergo will accept the proclamation. City of Boynton Beach Proclamation. Whereas city government is the government closest to most citizens and the one with the most direct daily impact upon its residents. And whereas municipal government provides services and programs that enhance the quality of life for residents, making their city their home. And whereas city government is administered for and by its citizens and it is dependent upon public commitment to and understanding of its many responsibilities. And whereas city government officials and employees share the responsibility to pass along the understanding of public service and their benefits. And whereas Florida City Government Week offers an opportunity, important opportunity for elected officials and cities staff to spread the word to all citizens of Florida, they, they can shape and influence the bran this branch of government. And whereas the Florida League of Cities and its member cities have joined together to teach citizens about municipal government through a variety of activities. Now, therefore, I, Stephen B. Grant, by virtue of the authority vested in me as mayor of the city of Boynton Beach, Florida, proclaim the week of October 19th to the 25th, 2020, as Florida City Government Week. And encourage all citizens, city government officials, and employees to participate in events that recognize and celebrate Florida City Government Week. The city also encourages educational partnerships between city government and schools, as well as civic groups and other organizations. Furthermore, the city supports and encourages all Florida City governments to actively promote and sponsor Florida City Government Week. Vice Mayor Pinserga, you have a few comments? Well, thank you, Mayor. I, I just wanna say that uh, I think our city is really leading the way and later today we're going to hear about our municipal app so i'm extremely excited about that and it's just one of the many ways that we are reaching out to our residents in ways that others are not and so on that line of thinking i'm also looking forward to hearing about our internship programs because more people need to know about careers in local government it's just not something that you talk about in school uh, but there are wonderful careers that people should know about, like being a city manager or being a public works director and so on. So these are all exciting things. And so I want to thank you for this proclamation. And our city is leading in the right direction. I couldn't be more prouder. Thank you. Our next proclamation is uh, the month of October 2020 as Domestic Violence Awareness Month. Jennifer Ray will with aid to victims of domestic abuse will accept the proclamation. City of Boynton Beach Proclamation. Whereas domestic violence continues to be a major social crisis and health care concern in our state and in Palm Beach County. And whereas the physical and emotional scars of domestic violence cast a long shadow on too many individuals who face the pain and fear of domestic violence regardless of race, age, ability, sexual orientation, gender identity, socioeconomic status, or citizenship. And whereas Florida reported 105,290 incidents, eight incidences of domestic violence in 2019, including 200 homicides and 21 manslaughters that resulted in the death of 37 children. Palm Beach County reported 4,633 domestic violence crimes in 2019, slightly up from 2018, including 10 homicides and two manslaughters. And whereas exposure to domestic violence in a home with children is considered child abuse. 
with lifelong effects on the children involved. The Department of Children and Family investigated 5,155 cases involving domestic violence in Palm Beach County last year, a very slight increase from the previous year. And whereas there were 522 verified cases of maltreatment for family, household or intimate partner violence that threatens a child in the county in 2019, which is a 13% increase from 2018 and approximately a 32% decrease since 2015. And whereas Domestic Violence Council of Palm Beach County is coordinating a community-based response through advocacy education prevention with the goal of reducing the impact of violence on families. There were 244 dedicated advocates, therapists, case managers, attorneys, and volunteers across 10 organizations providing support to safety planning, access to emergency housing, and supportive services to survivors of domestic violence throughout the COVID-19 pandemic. Now, therefore, I, Stephen B. Grant, Mayor of the City of Boynton Beach, Florida, to hereby proclaim the month of October 2020 as Domestic Violence Awareness Month. Hello, Mayor Grant, Commissioners. Um, we really appreciate this. My name is Jennifer Ray, Program Services Director with Aid to Victims of Domestic Abuse. Um, it's really our honor um, that you all proclaim this in the City of Boynton Beach. As the co-chair of the Domestic Violence Council, we're also, as a whole council in our county, um, really grateful for your support in the city of Boynton Beach. As a director at AVDA, um, we're grateful for the support that you provide um, through your grant programs for us to be able to work to prevent intimate partner violence in uh, the city of Boynton Beach. We do a lot of amazing work throughout the city, but specifically within Boynton Beach Community High School. One small note that I wanted to make was that we did notice during the onset of the stay at home orders that our hotline calls dropped quite dramatically um, with victims of domestic violence being stuck at home in the same space as their abusive partners. They were not able to find ways to get away and make a physical phone call speaking to us on the phone and, and doing so safely. So we researched a program and have launched our secure text enabled hotline. So our same hotline number at 561-265-2900 um, can now be texted um, by survivors of domestic violence who might not be able to make a physical phone call due to safety issues if they're close by their abuser. Um, so just wanted your community to know that as another option for survivors to reach out. And thank you so much um, year after year for your support of this issue in your community. Thank you so much. Our next proclamation is uh, for the week of October 18th to the 24th, 2020 is Poverty Awareness Week in the city of Boynton Beach. Kimberly Bush, CEO of Pathways to Prosperity will accept the proclamation. Whereas Circles of Palm Beach County, a program of Pathways to, of Pro Pathways to Prosperity is part of a national movement to end poverty. And whereas Circles of Palm Beach County is promoting Poverty Awareness Week to increase awareness to issues related to low income families in our community. And whereas throughout the week, community members will have an opportunity to participate in a variety of activities and commit to challenges that will bring them face to face with the barriers that impoverished people in our city experience on a daily basis. And whereas the challenge includes watching films illustrating society's everyday struggle with poverty, eating on $4.50 per day, taking public transportation for an entire day, and participating in a real life poverty uh, simulation. And whereas Circles of Palm Beach County will convene participants who took the challenge to discuss their experience and encourage individuals to get involved with Circles to fight poverty throughout Palm Beach County. Now, therefore, I, Stephen B. Grant, Mayor of the City of Boeing Beach, Florida, to hereby proclaim October 18th through the 24th, 2020, as Poverty Awareness Week. Thank you, Mayor Grant and the council members. Um, my name is Kimberly Bush. I'm very excited and very overwhelmed with the support that we have received now for 10 years from the city of Boynton Beach. This year, we absolutely celebrate 10 years of Pathways to Prosperity been in existence. And from day one, we have had your support. We thank you for recognizing Poverty Awareness Week. We have forwarded to your office different flyers on activities, and we invite you all to participate. We are proud to say that we have assisted many families within the city of Boynton Beach to transition to self-sufficiency. They are now homeowners 
and living productive lives. So thank you for your support and we look forward to working in Boynton and Palm Beach County at large for years to come. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Kimberly. I, I know I was uh, recently, I was one of the, on a panel for Circle's applications. And uh, one of the things that I'd like to work with you in the future, um, I know that we have your uh, community support funds later on in the agenda is to help ending the digital divide. Um, you know, I, in the city of Boynton Beach, we're hopefully going to have uh, free Wi-Fi over at Sarah Sims Park soon um, at our Little League field. And so my goal is to make sure that everyone in the city of Boynton Beach uh, can access the internet and be able to know how to access the internet for all the different resources it has on it. Yeah. My pleasure. And our last proclamation is for October 7th, 2020. It's Energy Efficient Day in the City of Boynton Beach. Rebecca Harvey, Sustainability Coordinator, will accept the proclamation. Whereas energy efficiency is one of the cheapest, quickest, and cleanest ways to meet our energy needs and reduce utility bills for residential, business, and industrial customers. And whereas energy efficiency can also make our homes and workspaces healthier, safer, and more comfortable. And whereas smarter energy use reduces the amount of electricity we need to power our lives, which helps avoid power plant emissions that can harm our health, pollute our air, and warm our climate. And whereas cutting energy waste saves U.S. consumers billions of dollars on their utility bills annually, up to $500 per household from appliance efficiency standards alone. And whereas more than 2.4 million Americans were working in the energy efficiency sector prior to the pandemic, in local good paying clean energy jobs that couldn't be outsourced and increasing America's recovery efforts by ramping up our efficiency efforts will sustain and create more of them. Whereas improved energy codes for homes and commercial buildings also can significantly reduce utility costs and create new jobs. And the city of Boynton Beach supports increasing the minimum levels of efficiency for new buildings through adoptions of a stricter code or the model 2021 International Energy Conservation Code. And whereas for cities and states tackling harmful pollution, energy efficiency can get them about halfway toward their climate goals. And whereas a nationwide network of energy efficiency groups and partners have designated the first Wednesday in October as the fifth national annual energy efficiency day. And whereas residents of Boynton Beach can contribute to sustainability by learning about energy efficiency, practicing smarter energy use in their daily lives and participating in the city's energy edge rebate program. And now, therefore, I, Stephen B. Grant, Mayor of the City of Boynton Beach, Florida, to hereby proclaim the seventh day of October 2020 as Energy Efficiency Day. Rebecca, would you like to accept the proclamation? Yes, thank you. Can you hear me? Yes, we can. Mayor. Thank you. Okay, thank you, Mayor and Commissioners. I'm Rebecca Harvey, Sustainability Coordinator. This is our fourth year participating in National Energy Efficiency Day. The city has recently demonstrated its commitment to energy efficiency by achieving Green Globes certification of both the new City Hall and the Boynton Beach Police Department for their efficient use of resources and reduction of environmental impacts. Energy Efficiency Day is also an opportunity to remind our residents and small businesses of a very unique program we have in the city called our Energy Edge Rebate Program. This program provides rebates of up to $1,500 for eligible air conditioning, insulation, doors and windows, reflective roofs, water heaters, solar, PV, and electric vehicle supply equipment. To date, since 2014, the program has provided 111 rebates totaling $106,000. And listeners can learn more about the rebate program at gogreenboynton.com. Thanks. Thank you, Rebecca. Um, our next is to announce the launch of the City of Boynton Beach official mobile application, the MyBB app. Who will be presented? Andrew. Andrew's going to make the announcement. John, you'll have to unmute him. Uh, Andrew Mack, you have been unmuted. You are currently self-muted. Okay. Uh, John, can you load up my presentation for me, please? Yes. Excellent. Thank you, uh, Mayor, Vice Mayor, and Commission. Uh, Andrew Mack, Director of Public Works. Um, 
I'm very excited to announce the city's first official app. Uh, we've been working on this for quite some time now, and uh, I get the honor of actually uh, announcing this and uh, giving you a preview of what's in store. Uh, next slide. So just, just a quick overview. Uh, the, the purpose of the app is to connect uh, the city of Boynton Beach residents anytime, anywhere uh, through the city's new official app. Uh, MyBB is what we call it, uh, is a free app which offers uh, easy 24-hour access to non-emergency services and information about the city. Um, you can pay bills, report concerns, read city news and more. Um, some of the uh, tabs that we have on it right now are report an issue, government, calendar, services, visitors, recreation and parks, hurricane preparedness, and city news. Uh, next slide. So just a quick timeline of how we got here. Uh, we issued a purchase order back in August of 2019. Uh, we then had kickoff meetings. We had ongoing weekly meetings with, uh, with uh, the company from August through September. Uh, we, had, we actually launched our internal My Staff app. Uh, was done back in November of 2019. Um, since then, we did some staff, staff training. Uh, we actually add, added the report and issue section to the city's website in July. And then we uh, made the uh, app, the MyBB app, available for download in October. And uh, tonight, we're doing the official announcement. Next slide. Again, as I mentioned, uh, this the new city app is available in the Apple Play Store, Apple, Apple Store and in Google Play. Uh, if you just type in City of Boynton Beach, it should come right up on your phone when you do that search in that in those two uh, stores. So just a quick uh, overview uh, again on uh, how to navigate. Um, the very first screen you see here on the left, that's the splash screen. When the, when you open up the app, that's the actual picture you'll see that opens up, and that's a picture of our new beautiful city hall taken from K-Pop Park. Um, the next screen, as you see on the, uh, you're moving from left to right, is the home screen. This is the screen that is your jump screen. It has all your options. And what it looks like there is you have a wheel. You can actually rotate that around and you can, not on our on our slide, but in real life on the app, you can rotate that around and you touch the buttons. So for instance, on the home screen, if you hit report an issue, it brings you to the next screen, which you then can use to uh, report any concerns you have about any of the stuff in the city. Uh, the next one is the government tab, which lists city commission, departments, advisory boards, codes, and finance uh, the calendar budget now give a little shout out to uh, David Scott he's got I had uh, when I did the the presentation he was having his business over coffee which was on the uh, the app at the time next slide uh, just continuing on on down with the different tabs you have services this is access to public safety garbage and recycling water utilities go green as Rebecca just mentioned and then emergency preparedness we have a visitors tab that gets you around and gives you a little information about Boynton Beach, art and culture, beach, the beach itself, uh, the Children's Museum and the marina. Uh, then we have another tab with recreation and parks that gives you information about all our neighborhood, community, waterfront, conservation and special use parks. And then we have the hurricane prep tab. Um, this tab with the nice part about our app, we're able to turn these tabs off and on. So during hurricane season or approaching hurricane season, we'll turn the hurricane prep app on uh, tab on and we'll continue that during the hurricane season and then you have city news this is a, a direct link to our information from our city website so it'll keep you real time with information next slide so again uh, just a little bit more of an overview of how to navigate through the the app i mentioned the uh, the city commission when you hit the city commission app it brings up uh, the next home screen which has a picture and a, a link to a bio of each of the one of the commission uh, members. Uh, as you can see, you got the Mayor Grant, Vice Mayor Penserga, Commissioner Katz, Commissioner Hay, and Commissioner Romulus. Um, this is directly information from our website and it links to pages on the website. Next slide. Okay, uh, what I wanted to do here was play you a little video about the reporting issue. Uh, it's just kind of a little tutorial. Tor 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 of how it works. If uh, if Alan or John can play that video for us. It's loading up right now. Excellent. And we'll continue to add content as we, you know. As this is Michelle. She loves her city. Michelle helps take care of her community. Whenever she finds issues like potholes, graffiti, trash, crime, and light pole issues, she reports it right away on her city's mobile app. 
Her City app has the Report an Issue feature that allows her to report issues from her phone. Her reports and her fellow citizens' reports are received by the respective departments instantly. John and the Public Works staff automatically get notified of the issues received by email or through the web content management system. From his desk, he manages all the issues, adding an estimated resolution date on each issue to help the department keep track of all issues. John can change the status of each issue, add notes, change issue type, and assign a staff member responsible to resolve it. Tony, our field staff, receives the issues on his mobile device. It helps him move through issues quicker and more efficiently. Through the mobile responsive content management system, Tony can easily manage each issue as they come in, wherever he is. At home, Michelle receives a notification that the issue she reported has been resolved. Through the City app, Michelle is kept updated on all the issues she's reported in the My Reports section. She can send additional notes, receive status changes, and receive direct messages from the City staff. Back in the office, John also receives an update that the issue has been resolved. He can effortlessly browse accurate data and analytics and download them into his computer for a department report. The CMS provides a wide range of issue reporting analytics that helps his office and his team make important decisions on the fly, like resource allocation, risk management plans, and budgeting. My Civic Apps, making your city brighter and smarter. John, we can go back to the presentation. A few more slides. All right, we wait for John to load that up. Uh, just a little bit about that uh, that video. Um, I think one of the neatest things that we've been able to do is the the My Civic app is to bringing to be able to report an issue in the field and get real time updates on your phone or through the city's website. I think it's gonna it's our it's already been in place. We've been using it again since November, uh, not through the city public app, but uh, if you called in our office, you, we actually added you to the system and added the information to the system, and then it was being pushed out to our our uh, it gets pushed out to our uh, our um, employees through their my staff app. John, you're able to get that back up for me. All right. Again, so um, just the, the rest of the, the information that was going to be I was going to talk about was in addition to the public app, we actually embedded this on our website and you can actually do, use the report a feature, the report an issue function on the city's website. So if you're able to go to the city's website and go under services, you can go to report an issue and it'll bring up a similar page where you can just go ahead and add. Thank you, John. So if you go to the next slide for me, please. Excellent. So, no, go back one slide. I wanted to show the the, uh, the app real quick, if you don't mind. So again, we go back to the report issue tab on the uh, app. You have the main screen, which, which brings you from the wheel. Uh, step one, you, as you see, you just click the light not working, or in this scenario, I did hit street lights, so light not working. It actually geocodes exactly where you are, or you could actually physically type in the address. Uh, you hit next, and then you can upload a picture and type a note in, and then you hit submit. The other thing I wanted to show you was under the My Reports, the little, we call them the hamburger uh, tab up there on the left of the of your, your phone. If you click that, you can see where it says My Reports. Uh, right there, you'll have a list of anything that you reported with the status. So there you have a one-stop shop. You hit that button. You can see exactly, all right, I've reported six items. Five are closed. They're still working on the one. And the other nice part of this is you can get push notifications through the app as well. Next slide. Okay, as I mentioned, uh, we added this same feature as a reporting issue to the city's website. Uh, you, you see a screenshot of the city's website. You go to the city on the tab of services. Uh, you click report an issue, uh, it brings you to this page. Next slide. And again, you, you just similar to the app, you just click on the different, the, the uh, actual item that you wanted to, to uh, raise a concern about or report an issue. You, you can click abandoned vehicle or cemetery or garbage and recycling. Next, next slide. 
again, this isn't uh, pre-populated. You can click the drop down menus and select the item that you want. Uh, enter the description in uh, and then type in the address. Then you can also upload media, uh, pictures, or if you had a document you wanted to upload. Next slide. Uh, again, next slide. Sorry. And then at the bottom here, you can type in your citizen information. This will help you keep get real-time updates. Uh, when you add that information, you don't have to, but you can submit it anonymously, anonymously uh, or you can actually uh, submit your information. Next page. So again, coming soon, uh, we're looking in the future of adding a business directory to this, uh, as well as ask a question. As you know, a lot of times it's not really an issue, but it's just really somebody has a question about a specific item. Uh, we'll be adding another tab that'll be ask a question. Uh, we also will have the ability to, uh, when we have that, now that we've launched the app, to push out notifications through the app. Some of these uh, uses, again, will be like boil water um, notice. Uh, we can do it by a geographical area uh, on a map. So if it's a neighborhood that, that had a wa water main break, we could go in and just highlight the neighborhood and it would push out a notification to all the customers in that geographical area, letting them know that they need to boil their water. And the same thing with like garbage route updates. So if we had a, a day where we couldn't finish a route, we would be able to go in and highlight that area and push out a notification to let the customers know, hey, sorry we missed you today, but we'll be back tomorrow. So make sure you leave your garbage out and as well as road road closures. Uh, and some other future stuff we're working on is notice and bulletins, uh, the potential for alarm registration, and uh, we'll just we'll be continually adding new features and content. Uh, actually, I got an update from uh, from Laura Landsberg. Uh, we actually uh, added two more tabs today, which was parking and uh, how to join the city team uh, employment. Next next slide, please. With that, I just want to give a big special thanks and, uh, and to all the staff that worked hard on this. It, it wasn't just me, it was a, it was a total team effort. We had uh, Yuri Konnikova, ITS Sport Manager, Laura Landsberg, uh, Marketing Manager, Adriana Greco, Aaron Sevilla, Assistant to the Public Works Director, Stephanie Brown, Solid Waste Customer Service Rep, Alan Kajip, Lynn, Web Design Coordinator, Gail Moots, Project Supervisor, and Chelsea Sanavia, uh, Marketing and Events. And with that, I'll leave it with. Uh, questions. Any questions you may have. My first question, Andrew, is when is it available online or at the App Store, Android, Google Play? It's available now. You can download right. that immediately. So I did type in my BB and it didn't come up. You got to type in City of Boynton Beach. Got it. If you type in City of Boynton Beach into your App Store or the Google Play Store, it should come right up. I also, if you go on the city, on the uh, um, the agenda item, I actually put the links on the agenda item too as well. And this presentation was uh, actually in my, my uh, as a part of the backup for the present, uh, for the agenda item as well. Okay. All right. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, yes, uh, Commissioner Hay, followed by Vice Mayor. Uh, Commissioner Hay, I believe you're muted. Vice Mayor, why don't you, you start? Sure. Thank you uh, to everybody on the team. Uh, this is going to really push us forward in terms of connecting with our city and make things more efficient. So I want to thank all of you for your hard work. Uh, Andrew, I had a couple of questions, but um, some of them I can just do it privately with you. But if I were the one using the app right now, would I be able, and perhaps I missed this, but would I be able to, for example, attach a picture of a cracked sidewalk or a pothole and then add the GPS location that would be incorporated into my submission? Absolutely. So as part of that, there's a place where you can upload features, uh, upload a picture or a document you may have, and then it geocodes. If you're on your phone, it geocodes it right to where you're standing. Fantastic. And my second question, and I guess I'll just leave it at these two for now, but what information do you collect from the user with this app? Um, right now, we're just collecting name and phone number and contact information. Okay. And, and as a voluntary, you can still submit anonymously. Got it. That's wonderful. And to Bobby, be clear, I'm sorry, did somebody say something? Oh, go ahead. Uh, 
I just wanted to be clear, Andrew, is this app collecting like location information when we're not using the app? I just want to ensure the privacy of the residents are secured and so people feel comfortable using it. Correct. So the purpose is for the location service is strictly just to report that specific location where you're actually at. So if you're you're going to look for like beach stuff on the app it's not collecting information the only time it collects it is when you're actually uploading a, a reporting issue got it thank you so much andrew mm -hmm. and to the entire team mr hey uh i guess i could can i be heard ron do you hear me okay good i just wanted to uh congratulate uh andrew mack and his staff on a, an outstanding job i was able to uh pull it up and load it. And I began to just kind of trial and error and uh, believe it or not, I was able to follow. So it is very user friendly. Yay. So uh, I really want to commend you guys. Uh, job well done. Um, I'm looking forward to uh, utilizing it and uh, telling others uh, uh, about it. So I may have you, uh, Andrew, to, uh, to talk to a, a particular group that I have in mind. Uh, so I'll be in contact with you a little bit later on, but job well done, man. Excellent, job well excellent. Done. We definitely would love to take it on a road show and uh, and get this in front of some <laughs> of the homeowners associations. So this is going to make uh, you know for for our staff it it cuts down on the volume of phone calls um, and it really helps uh, get the when you submit something it goes right from there right to the person in the field that needs to take care of it. So we're able to cut out a lot of the middleman through this process. So it makes us a lot more efficient. All right. Very good. And Mayor. so, yes, Commissioner Romulus. Thank you. Um, so yes, I'm I'm just ex as excited about this. This is something that um, I know and I, I've been asking for and requesting since I came on the commission nearly five years ago. So this is exciting to finally see this come into play. I just downloaded it and started kind of tweaking with it and everything. I do have some comments and suggestions already. I will. <laughs> reach out to you offline or please just call me um andrew so we can talk about it i have some suggestions on things we, we need to change so other than that looks great thank you for getting this up and running and then i know we'll probably have some some stuff that we have to kind of fix over time but this is great this is fantastic thank you all right seeing no further comments We'll move on to our next announcement, which is the grand opening of the playground areas in the, our downtown on October 17th. Eleanor is going to do that report, Mayor. John, is she self-muted? I'm, I'm sorry, who was going to be doing that report? Elnor. She said she needs to be unmuted. Yeah. Record, Eleanor Crusell, Director of Public Communications and Marketing. And before I make this announcement, I just want to encourage everyone to, um, Andrew is going to be have a live Facebook interview um, about my civic app on Friday at 10 a.m. So tune in and we will definitely um, spread the word as well that way. So now I'm pleased to announce that on Saturday, October 17th, we will open our town square playgrounds with Funfair in partnership with Compan beginning at 9 a.m. The city of Wayne Beach will welcome our first playground players to our town square public parks west of the cultural center and behind the schoolhouse museum with a local dj complimentary shaved ice cream cones from our local food truck vendor kona ice chalk art and some departing goodies to remember the day and increase our sustainability program here in boynton beach although the event is scheduled from 9 to 11 all children and their families are welcome to stay and play for the remainder of the day and as a reminder these playgrounds, as all our other public playgrounds, will be open seven days a week from sunrise to sunset. 
We encourage you to follow us on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram accounts for further details and utilize one of our new hashtags, Boynton Beach is my playground. And uh, Eleanor, are we going to have uh, extra masks and hand sanitizer uh, available? Yes, sir. Okay. Yes, sir. Thank you. All right. Thank you. Seeing no more further, we will hear a monthly update from JKM developers and E2L solutions on Town Square project. I believe we have, okay, yep. yeah, I think uh, Mark Heffern is, has a presentation he will do, and I think Mr. Markey uh, submitted a letter to the commission for with his update. So, John, you'll need to unmute Mark Heffern. Mark Heffern, you are unmuted currently. Thank you. Can you hear me? Yes, we can. Oh, great. Uh, good evening, Mayor Grant and Vice Mayor Pensarga. Commission, uh, Lori, great to see you all. Um, as requested uh, by Lori, we have been asked to just give you a quick update on the status of Town Square. So if I could, John, if uh, you'll go to the next slide. This was an aerial view taking about a month ago. We'll be taking updates this coming um, Thursday. Uh, as you can see, the main areas are all now paved and open for business. Uh, parking is shown both behind the museum and to the north uh, quadrant. Next slide. The police station, uh, we moved the uh, staff in on June 12th, uh, the artwork, as you can see to the right, has now been installed. Uh, beautiful viewing at night. I uh, hope everybody's had a chance to go by the building. I, I know at some point in time, the um, city did a flag raising. I'm uh, proud to say that we were in there today uh, to deliver a few things to the staff and uh, everything seems to be going extremely well. So we're in, we're in final punch out state for the fleet. Next slide. The, uh, we call it the high school when we started. It's the culture center today. Uh, we were able to move the staff in on July 2nd. Uh, of course, the COVID's uh, keeping the number of uh, public uh, people, residents being able to come in and out, but um, talking with Diane, things seem to be going well. So the same thing, we've, um, we're cleaning up a few punch list items. This is about a 30 day old photograph. Next slide. The fire station and district energy, uh, of course, DES was up and running in January to serve the town square with uh, chill water. I think uh, most of the uh, commission, uh, I know the mayor was there for the um, grand celebration. You can see a few of them standing outside on a rainy day, uh, June 2nd. So uh, all things are going well, and uh, we know they've been actively working uh, the transports in and out of the building since we opened. City Hall, uh, well, you jumped there on me there, John, if you could back up one. Uh, City Hall, we did a uh, move in on July 7th. You can see the um, grand celebration. Thank you for the key to the city. I promise I'll use it wisely. Um, but uh, it was a grand day to get everybody out there and the best of City Hall and, and actually the library also moved in a couple of weeks later. Here is a, a very current photo of the amphitheater. Uh, we will be bringing in um, the speak. Well, actually, the speakers and the lighting were actually installed this week. We'll be finishing that up and testing that system over the next couple of weeks. Next slide. The Centennial Park. I, I don't know if that's the official name, but uh, we'll be bringing in the sod on uh, October 12th to sod all this area to, to green it up, make it. Uh, been able to face of the uh, new City Hall Library. And we're also in the process of getting a time capsule delivered uh, on behalf of E2L for the city to uh, bring in your archives and decide what you would like to have placed in this. Uh, it's a fairly large uh, container that the city chose that I believe uh, Eleanor and uh, many of the staff are working on it is what will be uh, collected and, and put in here for the next 100 years. And, We've got a plaque that'll be placed on top of this after it's buried. Next slide. So we uh, we had meetings this week. 
uh, last Friday specifically, but again this week about the last piece of major artwork. This goes into the very front entryway of City Hall. Um, it started off with the, uh, the, the Stonehenge idea. This lights up at night, a uh, beautiful uh, part of art, uh, had plays music, and we've met with the uh, installers. They'll be coming in on uh, October 17th, 8th, October 16th is the current plan for installation. Next slide. So, uh, segue off of Eleanor's uh, great presentation, this is the children's playground, great is two to five. Um, we finished that up last week. We have a small section of fence to put in this week. And uh, we'll have this all wrapped up and ready for the um, event on October 17th. So we hope hope to be there and celebrate with the city. Next slide. The children playground from ages five to 12, as you can see, just a fabulous uh, addition to Kapok Park. And um, again, we've got some fencing that's going to be installed with the city's um, participation to uh, assure the safety of the, the children in this area. The asphalt parking to the left there was just installed this week, or actually last week. And then, as you can see, the temporary north parking lot, very busy, busy place. Um, city put in the gates uh, this past week, and we were able to uh, check on those as we were down there. Just got got back in. Today. And then the next slide, please. We have been working with the city on landscaping. The um, hotel site that's going to be proposed as overflow parking for events or anything as you, you open up uh, the city in full. Uh, so that's being finished up this week and really, really adds a, an attractive um, a component when you come in from Bolton Beach and Seacrest Corner. We also uh, put this slide in here. We, we met with the city um, uh, recently to talk about the site across from the hotel, which is the current parking, I mean, the current post office and our offices um, and taking in the connectivity of that. So we had a meeting yesterday, if you could get the next slide, John. With, with the hotel design, um, I'm sorry, John, if you get back on, we met with the city yesterday. Um, these are photographs taken with our drones this week. Um, the views that you would see from the proposed uh, pool deck and bar area from the hotel looking over KPOC and looking over the uh, high school, the Children's Museum. And this is at about 50 feet. You can see a little bit of the ocean in the background. And um, we're, we're working tomorrow on revising a, a little bit of the designs for parking and uh, progressing the design for the overall progress of the project. So I'll stop there and take any questions the uh, commission may have. Mark, I just want to thank you again for the, the cup. And uh, oh, done great. And so thank now, you for showing that. I, I appreciate that. Uh, we have one for all commissions. So uh, I believe Lori will be in charge of distributing those. But I did get to see Mayor Grant yesterday. It was nice to be able to deliver that in person. Thank you. And uh, it's a, it's a very exciting. Um, you know, the City Commission office just got the, uh, a computer. So I was looking at the city manager's shared uh, drive. And so looking back at the 2003 study of the historic high school, um, saying that it is something that we must save and remodel and refurbish. And I'm just glad that this commission is going to be able to see the, the fruits of the, the decades of labor uh, that the previous administrations have done in order to not demolish it. Um, I know that we called it, you called it the cultural center, but that's what uh, the Schoolhouse Children's Museum's nonprofit agency is called. So with, uh, I guess, the consensus of the city commission, uh, until we get a different name, do you mind recalling it the, the Boynton Beach Civic Center until we get a, a proper name for it? Because Cultural Center is already taken. <laughs> I Mayor. would be in favor of that because we already have a Civic Center. Yeah. I don't have a problem with it. I support it as well. Uh, yeah. Right. So, 
So in the meantime, it will stop being the old high school and now it will be the Boynton Beach Civic Center. I'm very happy about that. All right, uh, does anybody else from the commission have any questions? Seeing none, um, do we have the, the letter from JKM developers? Uh, yes, sir, I'll be loading that in a second. Does uh, the commission have any questions regarding the letter? Could it be zoomed in on? I can't read it. Uh, yes. Oh, well, it's scroll down. So go by each uh, sector, the south parcel. Mayor, if I may, when when the time is right, I'd like to uh, make a comment. Yes. All right, on that right there, John, leave that there or scroll back up to the north parcel. I, I, I just want the commission, to, I want to make it clear that staff is not actively negotiating anything at this moment. We did not receive that direction from you. Uh, at this point, we, we have... Um, had one exploratory or courtesy, professional courtesy meeting with uh, a developer that was interested that in possibly partnering, I think, with JKM. And we've met once with John Markey and he asked for the meeting. We sat down to just touch base. It's been six months since we sat in person and <laughs> literally was able to have a meeting. But I just want to make it clear that um, your city staff is not out negotiating anything outside of the motion that you've made. Uh, until we receive direction otherwise, uh, we will not continue, you know, there's no need to have any further meetings at this point, but uh, until you decide something different, I just want to make sure you understand where your staff fully understands what the motion that was made and approved by the entirety of the commission. Mayor? Yes. Thank you. And thank you, um, Lori. Yeah, I wanted to to get clarification on that or, or what seemed like efforts by JKM to reach out to commissioners to engage in individual negotiations that circumvented the motion. So I don't know if, if the city attorney could comment, but to be crystal clear, the motion that was passed at a previous meeting was to explain how to proceed as the current contract states by JKM or to acknowledge an inability to adhere to the contract and discuss winding down the relationship is that if the city attorney could weigh in but those are the only two discussions that the city staff is authorized to have at this time not any any alternative plans any negotiations any reference to new aspects of the project yes, the uh, city manager and i i'm oh, sorry you can go I'm sorry, Commissioner. I, I I guess there's a bit of a lag in the uh, in the communication here. So I'll let you finish, and then I'll comment. Um, j just to to sum it up, if if it's not in the existing contract, and the conversation isn't how JKM intends to comply with the existing contract, there should be no conversation outside of that. Correct. Uh, that's correct. The city manager and I have discussed that and the difficulty of. Um, blocking all other kinds of communications. We understand the commission's motion and we will direct our energy uh, to those two options that were set forth in the motion. Thank you. And to the city manager or anyone else, I guess on staff was in, in lieu of an actual appearance tonight to answer questions or explain 
how they plan to proceed with the existing contract, which they stated in a letter recently to the city. Was there any reason given why this is being submitted as a letter and we're not able to question um, any representatives from JKM about their recent communication to the city about that they believe they are able to move forward? I know when I first, um, when we first scheduled, right when we finished our last commission meeting and we were, I was scheduling the town square update, I did email both Mr. Heffern and uh, Mr. Markey and said, hey, October 6th, we're due for our monthly update. Um, John Markey had indicated at that time he wasn't available, but he would have a representative uh, present. And then I think subsequently decided uh, just, to, just to submit their update in writing. So I don't know what their intention is moving forward. Um, you know, if, if next month when we do it in the first part of November, if they'll be here or not, we'll certainly ask. Thank you. And I won't editorialize too much, but I, I think it's disappointing that nobody showed up to answer any questions and all we have is a letter. Um, I would expect more given the gravity of this project and the dire state that JKM appears to be in. So I, I'm sure they'll listen to this uh, after this meeting. I would personally appreciate an actual human being discussing this massive project uh, in the future. That's why we scheduled these these monthly updates. Uh, if it was meant to be an email, we would have said so. That is all. All right. And um, you know the the resolution 18-48. It does require JCAM developers to make the the monthly update. It did not stay whether it's in writing or in person. So um, I did get re information that this is the update that we've gotten. And based upon the city's motion that there is no negotiation um, possible or unwinding down the contract, there's you know not much more to say um, because we've only given them two options. So. If there's no further comments, we will move on to public audience. Mayor, may I may I intervene for just a second? I thought we had an add-on item regarding the um, conclusion yes. of a piece of litigation. If thank you if for could... yes. So the, yes, item 12C uh, in regards to the the recent court order. Uh, Mayor, with your permission, I'm going to ask Deputy City Attorney Shauna Bridgman, who handled that matter with staff. Uh, both the creation of the nuisance um, abatement issues and also the litigation to uh, be recognized and to make the report to you. Uh, that will require John to enable her to speak. Okay, just a second. Okay, you have been unmuted. Uh, hello, everyone. I just wanted to give you a brief overview of what occurred in the Homing Inn case. Homing Inn is the first property that the city cited under the new chronic nuisance ordinance, or it was new at the time. And what the staff did prior to ever citing any of the properties was they did a mail out to all of the businesses in the area to give them notice that the city was looking to partner with these property owners whenever there were any sorts of nuisances or chronic nuisances on the property. The intent of the ordinance is to work collaboratively with the property owners rather than to penalize them. So what occurred with Homing Inn, which was the very first property that was cited, is staff had um, multiple meetings with the property owner uh, and their council to explain what sorts of conditions were, incur were occurring at the property, which is a hotel, uh, such as dark lighting, which allowed people to congregate in the parking lot and, and do drugs and things of that nature. So they recommended various improvements, such as in improving the lighting, adding a camera at the entrance so that they could capture the license plates coming and going, and other measures that would have helped to um, make the property less of an attractive nuisance. And so what occurred is the property owner failed to make any of the remedies that were recommended or discussed. The property owner then entered into a written agreement according to the ordinance to promise that they would make these repairs within a certain amount of time. There were several delays and eventually the property owner failed to meet the requirements of their agreement. And so the case was brought to the code magistrate. 
At that time, the code magistrate had three separate hearings to hear all of the information that the property owner wanted to provide and ultimately issued a, an order declaring the property a chronic nuisance. They then immediately filed an appeal and we've been uh, litigating the appeal for about a year now. And today, finally, we got a, a ruling from the 17th, from the 15th Circuit sitting in, its, sitting in its appellate capacity, and they ruled in favor of the city and, and denied the claims that were made uh, with regard to the legality of the program. So as of now, there the city's chronic nuisance ordinance and the manner in which the city implements the ordinance has been found to be lawful. And that's good news because we have other cases that are in the pipeline that are in, in progress. And so far, all of those are going well. And so that's the extent of my report. Thank you. Seeing no further comments, we will now move on to public audience. Individual speakers will be limited to three minute presentations. Please state your name and address for the record. If you wish to speak on an item later on in the agenda, now would be the time to let us know. My name is Roger Saberson. I live at 2740 Southwest 23rd Crandall Drive. And uh, I sent an email to the mayor and commissioners and the city manager last week asking that the Palm Trail PUD final plat be taken from the consent agenda and allow people to speak on that agenda item. It will be allowed on the for people to speak. We will remove it from consent agenda and we'll give you the opportunity to speak on that item. Okay, would that be right after the consent agenda? That will be before the consent agenda is approved. Before the consent agenda. Isn't that the next item? Uh, after administrative. Okay. All right, thank you. Will it be, will it be opened up? discussion yeah. as we go through each item so it's the the question is is that will items be opened up is that any of the items for consent agenda or section section six subsection seven um public hearing that will have an opportunity to be heard but any of these things on city manager's report legal or future agenda items if someone from the audience would like to speak on any of those items please let me know so we can pull it and have, give you the opportunity to speak. You being public allows you the opportunity of going to the podium. However, this is also for uh, people online that they don't have the opportunity to go to the podium. Yes. And so, Ms. Sawyer. Thank you. Um, dear Mayor, City Mayor, 140 Southeast 27th Way. Dear Mayor and Commissioners, City, the city of Boynton Beach has been a leader in sustainability for many years and has achieved regional and international recognition as a member of the Southeast Florida Regional Climate Change Compact and the Global Covenant of Mayors for Climate and Energy. Earlier this year, the City Commission unanimously approved the updated 2020 Climate Action Plan with aggressive science-based targets of reducing our, our community-wide greenhouse gas emissions 50% by 2035 and achieving net zero emissions by 2050. Last month, the Commission again unanimously adopted the goal of planting 45,000 trees over 15 years to increase our tree canopy coverage from 16% to 20%. As residents and dedicated members of the City's Sustainability Advisory Team, of which I'm probably one of the original ones, um, we are extremely proud of our City's legacy and ongoing commitment to protect the natural world and address climate change head on. We, um, this letter has been sent out to all the commissioners. We write to you today to ask you to please honor this commitment by rescinding resolution 20-087 and not South Nichols Boulevard property. This publicly owned land, although just outside the city limits by about two blocks, is owned by the citizens of Boynton Beach and is the only remaining forested land anywhere near Boynton Beach that has not been preserved. The Nichols property is a functional and rare natural area deserving of protection Hundreds and hundreds of trees flourish there, including more than 100 mature Florida slash pines, home to our resident bald eagles. Yes, we have nesting bald eagles and a variety of other wildlife. Neighbors report numerous sightings of gopher tortoises, owls, foxes, and swallowtail kites. The rationales for developing the property and thereby doing environmental harm are twofold. One, 
The citizens of Boynton Beach will benefit from a one-time infusion of cash into the city coffers. And two, at some point, intervening properties could be annexed by the city. And if the Nichols property is contiguous to the city boundaries, it too could be annexed and increase the tax base. We, the sustainability advisory team, counter these arguments. One, this relatively minor one-time cash infusion is a band-aid. Forests, on the other hand, provide habitats for animals, offer watershed protection, prevent soil erosion, and mitigate climate change. And two, gross increases in taxes from new households rarely translate into adequate new net taxes. Extra density results in lower quality of life for current taxpayers. Examples of this are crowding at the beach and delays entering and exiting I-95. The city of Boynton Beach has added tens of thousands of residents in the last decade, yet these net tax revenues have not lowered the millage rate. Nor has the city added or protected green space during this time period. Studies show that cities with lots of green space have higher property values, which equals higher tax revenues. And yes, there is a study on that in the Palm Beach Post. Thank you for considering our request, the members of the sustainability advisory team, of which I am one, Susan Oyer. And please don't sell the Nichols property. Please let's make it a nature preserve. Thank yeah. you. Mayor. Mayor. Yes, Commissioner Ramos, you have a question? I, I just need to make a comment that members coming up to the podium should still have a mask on as it is required by our policy to keep a mask on in the building. They are more than six feet from anyone. No, that's not the problem. It's the fact that they're speaking into the mic and that is a potential hazard. Am I okay without a mask? You're okay without the mask. Okay, I'll put it right back on. My name is Tom Wardke. I live at 2780 Worcester Road, and this is about three minutes and 20 seconds. The All right, thanks Nichols for letting me know. Nichols Boulevard Forest is 14 acres. It's 600 yards north to south, 300 yards wide. It is 2.3 miles from right here at City Hall, just past Congress. There has been little or no discussion of the value of this forest beyond that of vacant land. In fact, it is not vacant. It meets all definitions of a forest from state, federal, and even United Nations definitions and the International Union of Forest Research Organizations. I went into the forest for three hours this week and I saw about 25% of it. I believe it is priceless. The coronavirus has resulted in many residents not being aware of the city's plan to sell this forest. So we are asking for time to show the value of this public land and why it should not be sold for housing. Very near this 14-acre forest is the Boynton Mall property, now zoned mixed use. So hundreds of residents are expected to be built there. The forest is a one-minute bike ride from the mall property along the Boynton Canal on a road past only 12 homes. Part of the property can become a shaded dog park. This is a five-minute walk from the mall property, no vehicles needed. Value added to all the properties here. Palm Beach County's Environmental Resource Management Division visited the property recently and reports that there needs to be a comprehensive site inspection, and the county is certainly interested in having the native forest preserved. There is no cost to preserving the land. The residents of Boynton Beach own it. Also, after consulting with agency people, I believe that Pulte Homes has a poor record of protecting preserved land. As one example, they sub out clearing and many things are destroyed. The value of such a forest as this has been estimated at $100,000 per year per acre. That's $14 million over 10 years, according to the Florida Native Plant Society. This forest can become a destination for Palm Beach County School District students. Pine Jog Environmental Preserve has 25,000 students visit every year, another added value. With limited parking, the new Park Mobile app can let people know when parking is available and generate income for the city. The question of operating a park outside the city, we have a very successful example of that, Boynton Beach Oceanfront Park. This forest is a valuable, valuable carbon sink. Carbon sequestration is a way to offset climate change, and this property does that better than any property owned by the city. That is climate change mitigation. The ecosystem services of forests are important for poverty, alleviation, and developing sustainability for society. The Florida Aquifer System 
runs under this forest and is the drinking water source for Borton Beach. Saltwater intrusion is a threat to our wells and the filtered freshwater recharge provided by this forest is very valuable to the city of Borton Beach. Palm Beach County's Property and Real Estate Management Division, Division allocates money each year for acquisition of land such as this and the city manager can consult with the county to assess the feasibility of adding this forest for possible purchase by the county, also for use by Morton residents. There is not another forest like this owned by the city or available to the city and you have no purchase costs. This is your last opportunity to preserve a forest such as this. We are not asking that one, we are now asking that one of you make a motion to rescind the resolution and not move forward with the sale of this forest or make a motion to delay until the sale, uh, delay the sale until the city commission can assess the real value of the forest uh, that it can provide to the residents of the city of Boynton Beach. Thank you. I, I, I enjoy going out in the woods. This is a very special wooded area and it, it is a forest. Appreciate it. Thank you. Tom. Hello, my name is Laura Milligan. I live at 3621 Harlow Avenue. I'm also here to speak about the Nichols property. I agree 100% with the previous two speakers had said. Palm Beach County dedicated the use of the Nichols property for public purposes when the property was conveyed to the city of Boynton Beach in 1961. Recently, the land has been referred to as a future park site. We object to any offer to have houses built on this property. There are very few wildlife areas left in Boynton Beach. Many animals have been seen in the woods, as said, foxes, many types of birds, bald eagles, gopher tortoises, not only are bald eagles and gopher tortoises protected under state law, but the gopher tortoises would also have to be relocated before any land clearing and development. There is so much land clearing happening throughout the state of Florida that eventually there will be very little land left for wildlife due to housing developments and other buildings replacing it. Studies have proven that trees are crucial in keeping cities cool, according to Tech Times, Science Daily, and the Environmental Protection Agency, just to name a few. Surfaces such as sidewalks, buildings, and roads absorb heat from the sun in the day and release heat at night. Trees not only create shade, but they also transpire and release water into the air through the leaves. This water has been proven to cool the atmosphere, which benefits the local area and the earth as a whole. Furthermore, Ken Caldera, who is with the team at Lawrence Berkeley National Laboratory, says this shows us that the evaporation of water from trees and lakes and urban parks, like New York Central Park, not only helps keep our cities cool, but also helps the whole planet cool. Forests fight global warming in ways more important than previously understood according to Science Daily. Besides consuming carbon dioxide, trees impact climate by regulating the exchange of water and heat between the Earth's surface and the atmosphere. This is an important factor that should be considered by policymakers' efforts to conserve forest land. I'm here not today for not only our benefit, but for the benefit of future generations to enjoy what little wildlife we have left and protect our planet. I'm submitting a petition from 88 concerned people stating we hereby petition the city of Boynton Beach to honor the deed restriction for the property to be used for public purposes and to protect our wildlife. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Hi, my name is Nicole Spikes. I live at 9430 Nichols Boulevard. I actually live right across the street. We've been there seven years. We rented, we bought because of where it was across the street. There's no traffic. We have one way in, one way out. The community, everybody walks along that area. I personally have seen and helped the tortoises. I have pictures of the foxes. We have pictures of the bald eagles. It needs to stay the way it is. 
It is a small community having 93 houses coming in there with one way in and one way out. The traffic will be ridiculous. It will not be safe for our kids to bike ride anymore. It will not be safe for our kids to take walks. It will not be safe for us to take walks. Someone needs to stop the sale of this and make everything that everybody has said here is absolutely correct. And someone really needs to take that into consideration. Good afternoon. My name is Michael Sorzina. I live in 9341 Long Meadow Circle. Uh, thank you, Mayor. Thank you, Commissioners, for allowing us time to voice our opinion here. Um, you know, just today, I, I, my property borders the Nichol, Nichols Boulevard property. Just today, uh, I, I watched a fox, you know, walk past the, the dens that are uh, right at the property line there. And, um, you know, there's three active gopher tortoises that live on this property. I'm not a professional. My understanding is that in 1961, uh, the city of Boynton Beach accepted, or this land was conveyed to the city of Boynton Beach uh, through a resolution. Uh, within that resolution, it states that it was to be used for public use. Uh, the, the neighborhoods that surround the Nichols Boulevard property are uh, unincorporated, so we are resident. We are, uh, you know, represented by the, the county. Um, as far as my understanding and uh, how this has been represented, um, the land was not for sale. A letter of intent was received, and uh, you know it was. It's been further discussed. My concerns are on the representation of both the the residents that live in that area, as well as the wildlife that inhabits that area. Um, you know, I know Boynton Beach or the city of Boynton Beach had adopted a uh, or had a proclamation in 2018. Uh, National Gopher Tortoise Day. This day was also uh, a mention of Nichols Boulevard was also made as a property that uh, houses gopher tortoises. So I would really hope that um, I'm pleading with the commission, the mayor, to, to perform a, uh, a true analysis and, and determination and the impact this, you know, the sale of this land would have and uh, if it sits well. Thank you. Is there anyone else from the audience? John, do you have anyone uh, with the hand raised? Or would like to ask a question? Uh, yes, Mayor Grant, we have three individuals. I'm gonna unmute uh, Daryl Sanders. Mayor. Yes. I just wanna remind you that this item is on the agenda and the last few speakers have all spoken on this particular item that's on the agenda. I understand it's literally the last item on the, the agenda and so rather than making them wait if they don't want to wait till the very end give them the opportunity to speak for the three minutes plus they are here so and that's, and that's fine um if that's the case then then perhaps we should entertain a motion to move that agenda up on the agenda uh, move that item up on the agenda um i'll be happy to entertain that if you were making it so moved i would second that with Commissioner Hay. I just wanted to comment that, uh, you know, I was going to bring the same point up, but I've been offline for a while. I lost my net. But we have to be careful with that because we have to do the same thing for others in the future. So I'm all for moving it up right now, but not let that be a practice in, in the future. I understand. And so I'd like to, you know, I know there's other people here uh, regarding item on uh, the consent agenda. So I'd like to, to put it after uh, item subsection six, but before section seven. Mayor Grant, I have uh, unmuted the microphone of Daryl Sanders. Hi. Daryl Sanders, 2001, uh, Northwest Second Street, Boynton Beach. Um, my question is, where, where and are there plans, plans to elevate the stage at um, Sarah Sims Park? Uh, when and if prior to June 19, 2021, can it be to, delayed to after um, July? Because um, 
we're, we're planning uh, the Chevy TV Foundation along with Boynt and Strong. We're actually planning uh, our Juneteenth event in light that COVID is um, over with at the time. Um, so we wouldn't want that, of course, the construction of the stage to interfere with, with the, um, the Juneteenth weekend. So, um, yeah, that's just my question. Is there a plan to elevate the stage when, and if so, can it be laid, be delayed to after July of 2021? Um, I guess, uh, Lori, can you get back with, uh, Daryl with that answer? I know that I'd you know, be in favor of delaying it until July. Yeah, I'd like to, the opportunity to get with staff, find out what the status is um, and the timing, and I'll certainly let you know. All right. So did, did Daryl say stay away from the the month of June? Basically, yes. he's saying uh, yeah, so June, June 21st would, could be the first day. After Juneteenth. Yes, thank you. Not necessarily. Uh, let, let's just talk about it. But we won't. We, we'll we'll schedule it so that we don't interfere with Juneteenth. But I don't want to just lock in that we won't do anything until after June. So we'll talk about it. We exactly the the planning and the developing can be done before, but the construction can wait till after. Exactly. All right. Yes. Thank you. All right. Uh, Mayor? Yes. Before we go any further, uh, I apologize, but uh, I lost my internet. So I was, I was off the air for, for a while there. And, and if, I, if I may, I know you gave, uh, uh, you donated $250. To, We're not there uh, yet. Uh, We're not there. Are you not there? You not there? Gotcha. Okay, thank you. Thank you. You're welcome. Okay, Mayor Grant, the next is, uh, I have the microphone of Elizabeth Roku. Apologize for the mispronunciation. Um, hello, everyone. This is Elizabeth Roku, Centennial Management. And um, the reason I'm raising my hand at this point, I know we're, we're, we've been moved up on the agenda, but as a, as a comment, I believe that all of these comments uh, should have been addressed prior to tonight's meeting. I think that the city and the people were given the opportunity um, to, to be able to speak with how they felt about this plan being sold before if, and a decision has already been made to sell the land and I respect what their comments are. Um, but so, I don't know that it's- So Elizabeth, you're, you know, we, we're moving that item up. So item 12B, okay. discussion and direction of the city commission regarding the letter of intent from Mallorca Isles LLC regarding the Nichols Boulevard property. Um, we're going to have that discussion after or before consent bids and purchases over 100,000. So we will give you an opportunity to speak then. Okay, no problem. Thank and we'll, you. We'll give anyone else that would like to speak on that item that opportunity to speak at that time. Okay, Mayor Grant, I am unmuting the microphone of Preston Smith. Thank you, Preston Smith. 220 Southeast 2nd Avenue. Good evening, Mayor and Commissioners. Why are the residents in the vicinity of Town Square subjected to hourly church bells seven days a week? How is this church located somewhere near Seacrest and Boynton Boulevard, exempt from the city's loud noise ordinances? And let's be honest, this is really about ongoing free advertisements for this church, isn't it? Not to mention that bells play church music and church jingles that I never signed up for as a taxpayer. Uh, would we allow a Muslim mosque's calls to prayer blasting on loudspeakers five times a day? Of course not. There would be an uproar. I'm asking the commissioners to bar these church bells, or at the very least, a moratorium until a survey can be conducted of area residents' opinions. And if the commissioners dare to think that it should continue based on tradition, there comes a time 
when outdated traditions need to change. This noise pollution may have been fine in 1898 when Boynton was founded, but I doubt anyone is relying on church bells nowadays to keep track of time. According to Pew Research, two thirds of Americans agree that religion as a whole is losing its influence on American life. And that's okay. According to Pew, the number of Americans who do not identify with any religion continues to outgrow all other religious categories. Those without religious beliefs are now 20% of the US public and a third of adults under age 30 are unchurched. Please spare us the daily dogma and let us enjoy Boynton without the guilt trip of skipping church. If people wanted to find a church, I'm sure they could somehow miraculously stumble upon one. Thank you for your consideration. I'm Preston, I wanna thank you for your, your comments. Um, you know, one of the things that we have not experienced in Boynton Beach for a while is the, the train horns um, that used to blow out in the middle of the night, way louder than the, the church bells. But I can understand your, your concern uh, and your opinion in regards to that. Um, I do believe it is the, the Methodist church that has been in the city of Boynton Beach for a very long time. Um, and so you are correct. Uh, community standards should go out there to make sure the decibel level is within the, the limits of the city. And uh, hopefully we can get back to you with uh, that level. Thank you, Mayor. I do appreciate that heartfelt response. And so I believe we have someone else with their hand raised. Mayor Grant, I'm trying to unmute the audio of Anne-Marie Lonergan, but I believe she is self-muted. Yeah, I believe she's going to speak on uh, the county uh, trail PUD, which is going to be the next item. So okay. uh, can we uh, unmute uh, Ms. Young? Uh, yes. Um, Ramona Young, 101 South Federal Highway. Good evening, Mayor and Commissioners and Lori. Um, you so rightly recognize uh, domestic violence and I appreciate that. However, you may have forgotten to recognize that it is also Breast Cancer Awareness Month. There are many people that have died. Uh, many are struggling and uh, many have survived, but I would appreciate it if the council would be able to recognize that this is our pink month and uh, we would like you to acknowledge breast cancer. To follow up also, and this may be insignificant, but I don't think so. When speaking into a microphone, it has now been recognized that the droplets can travel more than six feet and they can still live longer than from one person going from their seat to the podium to speak into the microphone. So I would suggest that you reconsider people speaking into the microphone with a mask on. We've had enough of this and it is devastating. It doesn't hurt. We can understand if people articulate and speak into the microphone with a mask on. Thank you. All right. And um, Ms. Young, thank you so much for your comments. I don't know if you can see, but I am wearing uh, my pink tie tonight in honor of uh, <laughs> breast cancer awareness. No, I um, can't see. And so with that, um, hopefully we can work with uh, an organization to proclaim uh, Breast Cancer Awareness Month in our second meeting uh, for this month. Thank you.
And uh, in regards to uh, your comments regarding not wearing a mask, um, it, it is 10 feet away. And so, you know, I, I understand the, the concern that you have. And so it is something that uh, we will make sure that um, that podium is uh, sanitized before anyone else touches it and that uh, we need to make sure to have the, the hand sanitized here here uh, in this uh, community room uh, for everyone going to that because multiple people have touched that podium now and uh, it's you're correct it is not cl as clean as it should be and so I believe our next speaker is Anne-Marie Lonegren it states that you're self-muted. Emory, we can hear your feedback. Hi, sorry. I, I was on in the car. I pulled over. Um, I don't know if we're on the topic of country walk or not. Um, yeah, we will be on that as soon as we're finished public audience, which will be very soon. So uh, do you want to just wait uh, maybe five to 10 more minutes? Of course, yes. Thank you for your consideration. I'll wait. All right. John, do we have anyone else with their hand raised or questions? I thought I saw Tori Orr. Um, Mayor Grant, you are correct. He did have his hand raised earlier. I'm not sure if you would like me to check and see. All right. So, uh, Tori. Hello. Yes. How y'all doing, Tori? How you doing, Woodrow? How you doing, Lori? How you doing, Ty? How you doing, oh, Christine? Right. Um, you know, I want to talk about the um, bill too about the about the stage. You know, concerning the stage of, of uh, Juneteenth. But I see y'all already answered that. And now I want to know about the um, do we know? Uh, do we have a time limit on when the Wi-Fi will be come? Will be at the Sarah, Sarah Sims Park? Do we have a timetable on when that's going to happen? Oh, go um, ahead, Laurie. I think it's I think it's up. It's up and active as of as of right now. John, correct me if I'm wrong, but didn't you tell me that today? Um, Laurie, yes, that is correct. The Wi-Fi signal is up. It is on uh, an access point on nine different light poles within the park. So the entire okay. of the park, which will also cover the inside and then also lead partially out from the park is covered with a free Wi-Fi signal. Oh, that's great. Thank you. That's real great. And uh, one more thing. Uh, I want to, with Mr. Woodrow Hayes, uh, this question is directly to you. Uh, when will um, the Carolyn Sims open back up to limit it? Will people be able to come to the Carolyn Sims Center as of not applications, job applications, as well as things opening back up? They don't have anywhere to go besides the library to go uh, have access to the computer? Do you know a time and date of when is the Carolyn Sims going to open back up to the public to a limited space? I'll defer that to the city manager. I know we're in phase three and I'm just texting Casey right now. I think Casey, you're on. Um, I don't know if we're opening it limitedly now. I, I, need, to, I, I need to refer to him or defer to him. We'll get back. Yeah, we'll I, I just okay, and um, okay, and uh, and I want to give a big, you know, I, I represent Breda Council too, you know, I always represent October, you know, Pink Month. I might get one of my dread pink, you know, I might, and uh, with that, I'm out. <laughs> I Thank dare you on that one. That would be awesome. <laughs> yeah, that would be. That would be scary. <laughs> <laughs> All right. And John, do we have anyone else with their hand raised? I do not believe I see anybody at this moment. All right. I'm now closing a public audience and moving on to administrative. Our first is uh, approve the request of Mayor Grant to distribute $250 of community support funds to Pathways to Prosperity. Mayor. Yes. To clarify, where on the agenda did you move the Nichols item? I moved in the, the Nichols item after consent agenda and before consent and bids and purchases over 100,000. Thank you. That'll be 6G. 
It, it's it's still item 12B, but it's just moved up on the agenda. So may I, may I have that uh, motion? I move. Thank you. Can I get a second, please? Second. Thank you. Seeing no more further discussion, all those in favor state so by saying aye. 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 All those opposed? Hearing none, motion passes unanimously. Mayor, Thank you. Yes. Uh, with, with the consent of this commission, uh, I, I would like to, to match your $250 uh, to a pathway to prosperity. All right. So well, I, make that, I, make that, I make that motion. All right. Second. Any further discussion? Seeing none, all those in favor, state so by saying aye. 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 Any opposed? Hearing none, motion passes unanimously. Thank you. Approve the request of Mayor Grant to distribute $200 of his community support funds to connect to greatness. Motion to approve. Second. Any further discussion? Seeing none, all those in favor state so by saying aye. 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 All those opposed? Motion passes uh, unanimously. Moving uh, on to item 5C, appoint eligible members to advisory boards. We have uh, no applicants. We have two regular and one alternate positions available on the Building Board of Adjustments and Appeals, two alternate positions available on the Library Board, and one regular position available on the Recreation and Parks Board. Item 5D, authorize the City Commission to attend the Florida League of Cities Legislative Conference, including travel and hotel stay at the Embassy Suites Orlando, Lake Buena Vista, South Kissimmee, Florida, on November 12th to the 13th. So, may I have a motion to approve? So moved. Uh, second comment. Yes. Um, if at all possible, uh, I would like to re remotely uh, chime in if that uh, uh, can be arranged. I don't want to be there in person. Yes, but, uh, I, I do believe a, a virtual presence is going to be available. Okay. So, um, and that's something that we'll just let the, the city manager know if you want to register, um, if you want your a hotel room, and you and how do you plan on traveling? Uh, I'm not going to be traveling. I'm going to be at home. Well, that's for uh, the other commissioners as well. We're doing a blanket oh, uh, approval for okay. all the commissioners and the mayor. No problem. So, I believe we have a first and second. Is there any further discussion? Seeing none, all those in favor, state so by saying aye. 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 All those opposed? Hearing none, motion passes unanimously. Moving on to uh, section six, consent agenda. I've uh, been asked to pull item 6E, approve the county trail PUD report plat subject to final signatures by the city engineer. Is there anything else uh, that the commission would like to pull? Seeing none, we will move uh, forward with item 6E, approve the count country trail PUD report record plat subject to final signatures by the city engineer. Um, if the commission allows, I will have uh, the public audience that would like to speak on this item go first. Yes, Mayor. Okay, Mr. Mayor and members of the commission and city manager, my name is Roger Saberson. I live at 2740 Southwest 23rd Cranbrook Drive where I have resided for the past 30 years. My property directly abuts this country trail PUD property. My property was built in accordance with all city codes, et cetera, at the time it was built in 1984, according to a city building permit that was issued by the city. This, this property, both myself and my neighbors, should be protected in future actions by the city of Boynton Beach. 
But what we have here is a proposal, a development proposal that greatly increases the flooding risk to my and my neighbor's property. I do not want stormwater inside my house. The houses that they're constructing are two feet higher, two feet higher than our houses. And just think how you would like it if you had a neighbor that directly abuts your property, built a home two feet higher than you. Do you think you're gonna get stormwater from that property? I think so. Now, you know, and, and you have to keep in mind that this project is landlocked. It has no drainage outlet. They either retain it on the site, it percolates into the soil, or it gets pushed onto neighboring properties like Silver Lake. You know, it's not like Serrano, which is to the south of us, which has an outlet to uh, like a Lake Worth Drainage District Canal. This doesn't have. You know, and you know, I just it was this this last week I opened my monthly uh, City of Boynton Beach water and sewer bill. In that is a pamphlet about flooding risk and encouraging us to protect our property from flooding risk. You know, and here is the city considering a proposal where houses are going to be built directly abutting us two feet higher. How do we protect ourselves from that flooding risk? Um, there is a berm around the development front. Is to be to the top top of the barn is supposed to be built to the 100 year flood requirements and uh, i know the city engineer is listening and the top of the firm is set at 13.5 and then gary i just like to ask is that the 100 year flood level i don't know if he's going to respond okay i was, I was told that he would be able to respond uh, to the item now the berm it's like a small little mound, a mound, and it slopes down towards my property and my neighbor's property, the outside of the berm. The bottom of the berm is a swale. The swale is only 12 inches deep. And I asked the city engineer who, if that swale was designed to retain flood loggers from a hundred year storm? And the answer was no. And while I have the city engineer with me, I wanted to thank him again for coming out to my property so I could show him how the property is situated. My property, my living room, dining room, kitchen, the floor of those rooms permitted by the city of Boynton is at absolute ground level. So if we get any drainage from this project, coming into our property, it's coming right into our living room. You know, now the swale, just think of the swale, you know, the slope of the swale, suppose it rains 16 inches, which I'm told is the 100 year flood zone. That drains into the swale. And then you've got 16 inches of rain falling directly into the swale. So what do we have? 32 inches of rain being piled into a 12 inch swale. I mean, that, that doesn't sound right. It probably isn't. But the swale is going to be taking on a lot more water than it can handle. And the, the city requirement in regard to the swale, which the city commission approved, was that it's required that the swale was to capture the runoff to prevent it prevented from flowing on to flowing off site. In discussions with the city engineer it has indicated to me that the discharge into our subdivision from this development will add about one inch of level to our Silver Lake Lake, our Silver Lake Lake, which is 26 acres. Now one inch doesn't sound like a lot, it's spread over 26 acres. That's a lot of water. And I don't want it flowing through my living room. 
Now, another commission condition was that if the site, their site, imports stormwater runoff in a pre-development condition, it's required to accommodate this runoff in a post-development condition. The proposal before you, development proposal, does not comply with that requirement. The developer cited our water management district permit that says you should retain the water on your site, which you know would be a good idea. <laughs> I like the developer to retain the water on their site, but in any event, you know this this condition. They're not com they're not complying with this condition, and this there is some discharge from Silver Lake going onto that property which has been happening for 30 years. And if it had been 30 years, that establishes some sort of prescriptive right to continue that. And the developer should be required to accommodate that in accordance with the city required conditions. I believe that is part of the conditions. It's part of the conditions, but the developer's response to that is, oh no, you know, the water management district permit for Silver Lake says they're supposed to re <coughs> retain water on their site. That's okay, why yeah. we have a city engineer that oversees People that. So, well, so the, the, you know, Mr. Saberson, I don't want to interrupt you. I gave you the, the full three minutes and a little bit more, but you know, the the aspect of tonight's plat isn't necessarily the overflow of water or the storm water or the retention. That was part of the conditions of approval. Right now, we are as the city commission just determining what we've already approved regarding the site plan, which we are required to do because if we don't move forward with the permitted use that we gave them, we could be liable in a lawsuit. In connection with this approval, yes, you're approving the final plat. And the final plat, no, we are. That's, that's what it says on the agenda. However, it is still subject to the city engineers' study of this. So, well, I, if the know, city engineer determines that this final plat is not valid. They don't get a permit. Well, if your condition in the agenda, if it said it was subject to the engineer's further evaluation and study, that would be fine. All it says is that it's subject to the engineer's signature, which is strictly a ministerial act, requires no exercise of discretion, and does not at all imply what you're saying that the city engineer can further evaluate and study this and if his evaluation indicates that something more should be done that you can require it uh i was that's, that's what i was told by the assistant city manager card recording according to the conditions of approval for permitting well last point city city condition requires that the property retain on site essentially the water that came into that site before. In other words, the post-development condition is supposed to equate with the pre-development condition, which was no discharge. Now, they say, and this is an erroneous citation in their report, they say that under the pre-development condition that their site discharged on our site, 19.4 some acre inches, which is to my property is absolutely false. Over the 30 years I've lived there through four or five hurricanes, I have not had one drop of water from that site discharged to my site. That site has actually acted as a reservoir for the storm water that came in in hurricanes. So, so isn't that what this is doing with the, the, the berm and everything is going to no. act as? No, that's part of my problem. And so, the that, so I, I, I disagree because I, even though I'm not an engineer and I don't know if you are, but no. so that's, that's kind of where the city engineer is and that's, that's what we're relying on. And so I'm going to ask legal if our city engineer approves a, a study and approval and it does not, it ends up being wrong, is the city liable? And the city gets to require additional planning. 
So we have an answer in regard to that before we move on. Mayor, you, you want my response to your question about liability? Correct. The city would not have liability if the city engineer um, up, um, acknowledges that and, and signs a document that is platted in accordance with the development orders. The, the specific question is regarding the engineering studies that the city engineer approves. Um, that is, that states that the the hundred year flood is correct. However, if there's flooding that goes above the hundred year flood, or let's say it's a 25 year flood that it goes above, is the city still liable? The city was not liable under that scenario. Okay. Mr. Mayor. May I ask a question of the city attorney? Yes, you may. Okay. My question is this. If the city commission goes through with this agenda item, which says that the city is approving the final plat of this project, can the city engineer then go back to further study and decide, oh, you know what? We should have required more in terms of drainage. Mr. Developer, I want you to modify your drainage plan or I want you to replant this property. Can the city engineer do that? Can the city approve that? Will the city be liable for that? Mr. Saberson, I'm not going to get into a debate over the issues of the platting process. The plat that is before the commission um, is appropriately before the commission and, cons and is consistent with the development orders. That's why it has been advanced to the, to the commission agenda by city staff. Uh, the city uh, engineer's signature is required as a matter of, of uh, both practice and law. He exercises his discretion that it is in accordance with chapter two of the land development regulations. The city will have no liability once he signs that document. That, that's what I'm afraid of. That he's not gonna, he's not gonna, he, will, he won't think he can put in additional requirements and therefore he must sign. It's to his discretion. So thank you very much, Mr. Saberson. In any event, my final comment is my request is either to deny the project or postpone it so that the city engineer can exercise his discretion and possibly put in additional requirements. Thank you. Thank you. All right. Um, I do believe uh, Anne-Marie Lonegren, I'm going to unmute you. It says you're self-muted. You would like to speak on this item? Hi, sorry about the uh, back um, echo. We had a couple of public city commission meetings pertaining to this site development and proposed platting and development. It is on public record. The engineer who designed the plat, the site plan, the elevation design, the drainage, storm drainage, the percolation of the site, your landscaping, the photometrics stated in the public city commission that this, his design was not engineered and designed to the 100 year floodplain. They further went on to state that the flooding, the water that came off their site was not the issue. Their site is very much lower than my site. I have a certified survey. I don't have a certified survey of their property because I don't own it. But for a fact, their property is much lower than my existing lot and my elevation and that of the Crown of Our Road at 23rd Cranbrook Drive. That's a fact. The city has chosen to ignore that and push this plan forward. The city has said, well, we can look at it later we're just doing the zoning now. We're just incorporating this property now. We're really not responsible. We're not engineers. Our staff says it's okay and everything's fine. And your staff has an obligation to upload, to uphold the Florida Building Code. In fact, they should be arrested and sent to jail if they don't. And that has happened in many cities across South Florida for the simple reason that we're looking at here now. Actions have been taken by city officials that have caused harm 
to life and welfare and property. And they are liable. And the city is liable. And each and every one of you city commissioners is liable because in public forum and on public document, this has been stated by the engineer of record at the time that it was not and is not designed to current code. The mitigation of the rainwater and storm drainage is also public record. That none of their water flooded onto my site. In fact, there is no way the water ran uphill 24 to 30 inches and flooded my yard. Now, we have surveys, we have lots of certified, certified people, a lot of licensed, very smart people that have studied this. The city commission has chosen time and time again to push this forward. Now you're pushing it forward once again with known public record comments by everyone on your staff and the engineers that first designed it, it doesn't meet code. It doesn't even meet our own city published requirements. That's higher than the minimal code. And yet here we are going to push it forward again. Why? Why is that? I've got a hub marked out in front of my driveway right now from some survey company that the city hired, and it's not correct. Nobody can tell me if it's to an NGVD or an NAVD. Nobody in the city commission understands these terms. Nobody in the city commission is an engineer, and nobody in the city commission is then eligible to vote on this matter. And you are liable because you pushed it through the last time. So I would suggest, in all due diligence and with a conservative effort and for the best course of action for your citizens who reside here now, today, to push this off to another city commission, let your building department and property development people who are liable, who can go to jail for breaking the law, take a look at this. Because I have now sent this forward to the state, the county, South Florida Water Management, Lake Worth Drainage District, the Health Department, and every other chapter, verse, and department that I can figure out, right? in the state of Florida to take a look at this. And I'm willing to go even one step further and say, why is this being pushed through like this? What is in it for these city commissioners to disregard all of the educated, licensed, certified people who raise their hands and an open city commission state, hey, hey, I did. I only designed this to the 25-year floodplain back in the day, eight years ago, because the county only required it at the time. Not the city of Boynton. I didn't design these plans for the city of Boynton Beach for annexation of the city. He stated that in your meeting. It's on public record. And you all went, oh, well, we'll have to take a look at that. And you have failed to do so. And yet your city staff, under your tutelage, under your purview, goes, oh, well, I guess we'll wait for the city commissions to stamp off. Once they sign off, I can sign off. And your city engineer ought to be sweating in his boots right now because it's his license on the line. Ms. And Lonergan? it's his ticket they can go to jail for doing this, for breaking the law. It's Ms. a Lonergan, law we have. Do you have a, you know a question? We have these laws so people are or safe. Is, are Communities you, uh, are safe. A There's a reason that we don't want to flood streets during named storms because people die. That's why we have laws. And if you're not willing to uphold our laws and our cities and do your job as a hired city commission, city manager, mayor, then you shouldn't Ms. Lonergan, be in your seat. I'm gonna cut your microphone. Please take your you own due diligence. We understand you're us. not engineers. We understand. Oh, that's I'm sorry, Miss Lonergan. I like I said, I was trying to talk over you and it wasn't working. But unless you have a question for the us as the city commission, I'm gonna have to move on to the next person. So I'm gonna allow you to be mute, uh, unmuted again, but I, I ask you again, if you have a final question for us before we move on to the next speaker. Ms. Lonergan, you're self-muted. Hi, why would you vote on this if you simply state you're not qualified to vote on this? All right, thank you for your question. Mayor. The aspect of it is, is that we did mention at the first time of approval that this was not set for the 25, it was set for a 25 year flood, not a hundred year flood. And the site plan has changed to reflect the hundred year site flood. According to 
Um, number 14 of the development order. Prior to permitting submitted a rectified site plan set depicting the changes presented at the April 2nd, 2019 commission meeting, including the expression of the drainage area to wrap the northeast corner of the parcel and enhancement of the area with additional landscaping, including shade and flowering trees. So prior to the permitting, which is not at this stage right now, this is just a recorded plat, they will have to approve uh, that the current design is up to the 100-year flooding. If it is not up to the 100-year flooding, then they will be at their own risk to replat because we will not, as the city, will not issue a permit uh, for the, the current site plan. Um, and I want to make sure that my statement is correct um, from the someone from planning and zoning or the assistant city manager. Uh, Colin Groff, assistant city manager. Mary, you are correct. Um, there are three conditions uh, on the approved site plan that must be met prior to any permit being issued. We have not received those plans nor those calculations to review because a permit has not been applied for as of yet. When they're applied, if those conditions are not met, which include all of the conditions that were spoken about by the um, uh, residents, those are not met, the permit will not be issued. If, if there are changes that required to the site plan, those have to go back through the process if they can't meet it with their current current uh, site plan. So the conditions are there and they will be met prior to the permit being issued. Okay, and I believe that our residents want to have access to those conditions uh, as soon as they are received by the city. Is that something that we can uh, make available? They are all public record once the application is uh, submitted. Okay, so if you wouldn't mind to let me know. We don't have them yet. Yeah, we don't have them yet. They haven't so, been no, we don't normally get to know when these things happen, but because of the, the residents' concern, if we could have information when the city receives them so we can relay them to the residents to make sure that if they have their own engineers that they want to to uh, approve the, the studies that they can go uh, do so at their own um, availability. Yes, the city engineer has uh, met with some of these uh, residents and, and yes, uh, you know, we have, everybody we have contact information, we have told them that we will let them know when a permit is um, applied for, which we have, like I said, we, there is no permit application as of this point. All right, thank you very much. Um, I did receive a, uh, a public comment um, from Luis Rodriguez uh, at 2659 Southwest 23rd Cranbrook Drive, Boynton Beach, Florida 33436. Hello, I would like to raise a question at the commission meeting regarding agenda topic 60, Country Trails PUD. As I understand it, the project was previously considered by this commission several times. The property is sold to another developer and plans to continue to be pursued regarding building demolition. Eliminating a pond and regrading the property in dense construction not typical of our surrounding communities, such that drainage to the adjacent properties located at, on Cranbrook Drive may be affected under certain conditions, such as major rain event, very common in South Florida. As a resident and homeowner directly adjacent to the property, I've not been contacted by anyone regarding impact to my property in New Swimming Pool. I would like to know my, more about my rights if runoff from the Country Trail PUD property affects my graded backyard and swimming pool. I'd like to review any drainage plans and have the city inform me of planning engineering standards related to such drainage, as well as the additional precautionary engineering mitigation being implemented. Does it meet state standards or does it try to exceed them? Additionally, I understand the development will have a six foot wood fence installed around it. I would like to understand how that offense affects my approval, approved and recently installed white PVC fencing. So Colin, uh, if we could also include uh, Mr. Gonzalez, on the Mr. Rodriguez, I'm sorry, on the list of people once the permit is applied for. Absolutely. All right. Mayor Grant, this is John McNally. There's also a comment in or a question. Uh, yes. By Joe Pike. All right. And it seems that Joe Pike is an engineer. I never stated that this project does not meet code. It met all drainage codes, even at the 25 year event, including the city's code. However, we now uh, development order comply with the elevated 100 year criteria as requested by the city engineer. So 
Thank you, Mr. Pike, for your comment. And so, if the commission has any more comments or concerns, may I have a motion to approve? So move. I could. Any further discussion from the commission? Seeing none, all those in Thank favor you. state yes. I just want to make sure that I understand the situation completely. So in terms of all those issues that were brought up by the residents, this those are addressed at the next phase. Is that right? At the permitting stage? The Colin Groff is in C manager. Yes, you are correct. Those are detailed engineering calculations and design documents that uh, the city will require uh, during the permitting phase and again we do not have a permit application so we cannot answer uh, whether or not they're compliant until they do submit a permit package uh, to be reviewed and all right and if it does not meet if it does not meet the conditions of approval it will not be approved understood and i appreciate the clarification at that point i will make that assessment um, but in terms of this action it's for the recording of the plat and so i will be voting in favor of it Thank you. All right. Seeing no further discussion, we have a motion and second in. All those in favor state so by saying aye. 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 All those opposed? Hearing none, motion passes unanimously. Thank you. Thank you. Um, moving on to the remainder of the consent agenda. Nice anyone? Thank you. Do I have a second? Second. Second. All right. All those in favor, state so by saying aye. 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 All those opposed? Hearing none, motion passes aye. unanimously. Moving up, item 12B, which is uh, the tabled item. So ha may I have a motion to remove from the table? So moved. Move. I have a thank you. Motion by Commissioner Hayes, second by Commissioner Katz. All those in favor state so by saying aye. 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 All those opposed? Um, so discussion and direction by city commission regarding the letter of intent for Mallorca Isles LLC regarding the Nichols Boulevard property. So um, uh, we've heard uh, from the audience. Uh, is there any members from the audience that has not spoken that would like to speak on this item? And so also for people on the, the, the go-to webinar, if you'd like to raise your hand or ask a question so we can recognize you. Good evening, it's Mike Corcoran, uh, 9317 Long Meadow Circle from the beach. Um, just want to put in my two cents. Um, my parents moved down to Boynton Beach in 1973. I came down and visited. Um, in 1980, I liked it so much, I bought a house in Long Meadow Circle, I backed up to the woods. Um, it has been the, I want to say, a pleasure to have Woods behind me, and, and the reason why I bought that particular property was for that reason. Now going forward, um, I have two golf autobuses in my backyard that are off of my property, but come onto my property to feed. Um, I think there's enough uh, blacktop in this country. I think that we need to maintain the woods as woods, um, there is a study that was taken on Gulf of Tartars that were relocated. 57% uh, of the Gulf of Tartars that were relocated uh, died. And um, I think that's a, a crime considering that they are endangered species. Key species. Um, I just, I'm, I'm opposed to the, the going forward of the Nichols uh, property. And I wish that um, they would maintain it as a forest the way it is. Thank you. All right. Yeah. So um, I know that there's, I believe, was it Elizabeth or Michelle Roque wanted to speak? I haven't seen. No. 
So um, before we allow anyone else to speak, you know, my comments, uh, oh, sorry, Elizabeth, we got your hand raised. Oh, I'm sorry. I, I thought I was supposed to raise my hand when it was our turn. I'm, whenever you're ready for me, let me know. All right. I have your, your, we're ready for you. And then Andrew Maxey, you are up next. All right. Beautiful. Well, thank you everyone for, um, again, putting this on your agenda and allowing us to be able to um, have the opportunity to speak with you tonight and letting you know you know how we feel about Boynton Beach and what our, our plans would be for um, this Nichols uh, 15 acres. And as you know, we've made an offer of $3,185,000, um, which is approximately $900,000 uh, more than your uh, first offer from Pulpit Home. And um, what I wanted to let you know is we did, we did attach a site plan for you so that you can see that what we're planning on doing with the 15 acres would be to have 39 single homes and 52 townhouses. We also put in about uh, three quarters of an acre of a preserve area. We put in a recreation area and we put in a lake. Um, and I also wanted to let you know that to the west of that property, there's approximately 10 acres that's owned by the Palm Beach County Housing Authority. Um, that is currently all all wooded and uh, about 10, 10 acres there, just in case, just in FYI. So um, some of the other things that I wanted to talk to you about were um, just kind of our, our offer and where we're at and, and why we feel that we would be the best um, one to be able to be able to build these homes and townhouses uh, in Boynton Beach is one, we already have a relationship with um, the city of Boynton Beach and we're established there. And we're a, um, a company that, that produces and we do what we say we're going to do. And we try to always keep in mind um, the community and the wants and needs of, of, of the city of Boynton Beach, because always this is not about us, it's, it's about the city and what, what you are all looking for to accomplish in your city. Um, and I know that some people may think, oh, well, they're multifamily developers, they only build affordable housing. Well, that's not true. And I had sent out an email to everyone letting them know that um, right now we're, we're uh, getting site plan approval in the city of Homestead for um, approximately 248 townhomes. And uh, we're also getting ready to do, um, uh, I'm sorry, and we're also getting ready to do um, 20 half acre um, homes and, and we're getting our, our plat ready for that now as well. So it's not something that's new to us. And as far as the environment is concerned, we like the environment and we like uh, making sure that when we have to take trees down, we take as little trees down as possible. Um, we're going through that right now with Wells Landing where we're going out and tagging every tree and making sure that nothing that doesn't have to be disturbed will be disturbed. And we also like putting in trees if we're taking trees out. Um, so we do care about our environment and we do care about, about the community. And uh, at the end of the day, our requirements to be able to close on this property are a lot less stringent uh, than that of, of Pulte Homes, where Pulte Homes is asking for one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten items before they, they'll be able to close. And if they don't achieve all of those items, they won't close on this property, where we're only asking for one, two, three, four, five of those. Um, one being site plan approval, the other one that all the deed restrictions are removed, um, the, uh, the approval of the vacation and the abandonment of the right of way, um, obtaining permits, easements for our utilities, and the service uh, utility agreement. And uh, as one of the most important things is, as well is that we can do um, uh, market rate and or workforce housing. And I know that um, housing is difficult sometimes. And if we do workforce housing, there's for teachers and police officers, and, and we can provide that need as well. So I wanted to make sure that you knew who Centennial Management was and how important the city of Boynton Beach is to us. And we'd like to continue that, that relationship with everyone there and, and again, be able to, to provide the, uh, the townhomes and, and the new single family homes uh, on the 15 acres. Thank you. 
Thank you. Our next speaker is uh, Andrew Maxey. It says you're self muted. You there? Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Yes, I'm here. And uh, right. Mr. Groff, uh, if you will, or John, we had just a very brief PowerPoint presentation that I wanted to go through. Um, if they could get that loaded up. Yes, sir. Loading up now. Thank you. Okay, great. And you can go ahead and advance the slide, John. Thank you. All right, good evening, everyone. My name is Andrew Maxey. I'm representing uh, Pulte Homes. Um, I just wanted this opportunity to briefly you know, introduce Pulte. Um, it's been a little bit since we've uh, done a project in the city, but obviously have a really, really big presence in Palm Beach County. We've been building here for 50 years. Um, you know, we, we're getting to a pretty big scale in terms of volume. You know, we'll close around 270 homes this year. We'll which will just about make us the biggest builder in Palm Beach County. Uh, so we're obviously investing a lot of money in the county and specifically uh, in areas around Boynton Beach. Um, our division has identified Boynton specifically as being you know, a strategic priority uh, for investment. And you know, in addition to the Nichols property, we're looking at actually several other opportunities within the city boundary, uh, as well as some additional opportunities with the CRA. So um, <clears throat> we're willing to, um, obviously make a big investment in the city and the Nichols property would be sort of the first step in that process. Um, all of our deals, you know, Michelle mentioned contingencies. We don't have any contingencies when it comes to financing and that includes purchasing the property as well as funding the development and the vertical construction. So we will not rely on any tax subsidies from that perspective. Uh, next slide, please, John. <clears throat> So just in terms of due diligence, you know, obviously we've been negotiating uh, this agreement with the city for actually well over a year now. And, and in that course of time, we've actually been doing a lot of work. Uh, one of the public speakers mentioned a deed restriction, and he is in fact correct. There is a public use deed restriction on a portion of the property, not all of the property based on the title work we've done. And consent is needed by both Palm Beach County and the Westside Baptist Church. Uh, we've engaged with both parties and we think we have a pretty clear path to getting either all of or a portion of that restriction removed. Uh, we've had some very fruitful conversations with the church and we think there's certainly an agreement we can come to with them uh, in the way of you know, landscaping improvements and making uh, their property look a little bit nicer. Uh, in addition, there's a very substantial offsite utility obligation. Uh, we basically have to bring water and sewer up from, from Old, Be Old Boynton Beach Boulevard and then tie it in back to the mall site. So that price alone is, you know, close to seven hundred thousand dollars, which you know easily makes up the gap uh, in purchase price between us and Centennial. So we think we've frankly done a lot of due diligence and identified really what the big cost items are on the property. Uh, so we're, you know, we do have some additional contingencies that maybe they don't have, but you also have to remember we're a year into this process. We're a year into our due diligence. We have a purchase and sale agreement that's been negotiated and approved. So. We're here before you tonight asking for permission to move forward. Uh, we obviously know that there's some environmental sensitivity and some community outreach concerns that we need to address. And we're always really good about that. You know, the first call I'm gonna make once we get an executed contract is to the neighborhood. And we're gonna work with the neighbors to come up with a plan that works, that appropriately conserves the vegetation and the native habitat on the property. And then I just have one final slide, John, if you would. <clears throat> So uh, yesterday we sent over a proposed amendment. So just to be clear, this is an amendment to the purchase and sale agreement that's already been approved uh, by, uh, by the commission. We are increasing our purchase price by about 22%. So our new offer is in the $2.7 million range. Um, at the last meeting, workforce housing came up. Uh, we also build workforce housing. So what we're committing to is 20% of the approved units on the site, we are gonna sell at a workforce rate. Uh, but the workforce rate is going to come without a deed restriction. So that allows people to get into an affordable home, uh, but also allow them to realize some price appreciation uh, in their asset. So we're not going to restrict them from that perspective. And then the final item that we had proposed it was an additional deposit. So as soon as we get the contract signed, we'll wire over $15,000 and that's non-refundable with no contingencies whatsoever just to get going. So uh, we're here tonight requesting you to, you know, approve this proposed amendment. 
and uh, and just allow us to take the next step. We're excited about the project. We know there's obviously some hurdles involved, uh, but we've you know been at this for a year, and uh, we respectfully ask that we have you know the opportunity to to pursue this great project. Um, and uh, that's it. I'm happy to answer any questions that you may have. Thank you for the opportunity. Mayor. Yes, Commissioner Romulus. Are we opening up for discussion now? Um, yes, I believe um, so. Yes, I believe so. Okay, great. Um, so I, I'd like to make my position on this item very clear from the beginning. Um, I am glad to see the um, Pulte Group come back with a higher um, offer, in addition also committing to uh, putting 20% of the units as workforce housing and also um, adding an additional deposit. Uh, if, if all of this is um, able to be agreed to and put in writing with the uh, approval of the city attorney, then I would be willing to make a motion to approve their offer and to not continue this uh, back and forth between uh, several parties because this has gotten a little out of hand over the last couple of weeks. And um, in addition to that, uh, after we finished discussing this item, I would like to uh, direct city staff to implement a policy so that we have a very clear uh, direction moving forward on how we address properties and letters of interest that come before us that we don't have uh, situations like this happen again. So I, 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 that is where I stand. All right, thank you. Uh, Commissioner Hay, you have your comments? Uh, yes, I, I've, I've heard it all, but um, I, I guess my question is, uh, when was the last time this property was appraised? Uh, has there been an appraisal that's uh, current? And, and if not, that needs to be uh, in existence before I, um, can can go forward with, with this. As my understanding, I did my research and correct me if I'm wrong. It was back in 2014 when the last right. appraisal was, was done. And I think that's a bit old. It needs to be updated. Mm -hmm. And uh, um, until I can see that, uh, I, I, I can't move forward uh, until I see that appraisal. All right. Vice Mayor, is that your hand up? Yes. yes. That's me. Thank you, Mayor. I want to echo some of the things I've heard. I couldn't agree more that moving forward after this situation, we do need to have that conversation about how we would proceed forward into the future uh, in terms of letters of interest, because we do have somebody who has been working with city staff for quite some time on this uh, agreement. And I love competition and we should welcome competition, but that's, you know, I, we all recognize that uh, they were caught off guard and um, it's not good for the reputation of the city uh, in terms of how we conduct business. And so we really do need to have that conversation. I also want to support what Commissioner Hay just said. Uh, that appraisal uh, is in 20, from 2014. And what I would like to see, and I have many things to say about this, but what I would like to see is the best deal possible uh, for our residents. And I want to address the environmental concerns in a minute, but I would like to have seen, and although I can't force uh, Pulte, I would have liked to have seen a proposal that exceeded their competition. I know they're able to do it. They're a very large company, well known, and I would like to have seen them come back with something more aggressive. My interest is to get the best deal for the residents. And so I'm hoping that with the support of the commission, if we go ahead and get another appraisal and if we can get it within the next week or two in time for our next meeting, uh, there, there is enough time for Pulte to come back with a better proposal. I'm going to go with what gives this city and its residents uh, the most revenue. And there are so many things we can do with that money. In terms of the environmental impact, I want to say that I completely agree, and it concerns me. I want to make sure that as a condition, uh, those animals that were discussed are preserved. 
Um, and I also want to just inform the public that to my understanding, and, and if staff, if I have this wrong, to my understanding, yes, uh, you know, we own the property, but ultimately what decides what gets built and how it's built, if anything is built at all, actually goes through the county. And so those concerns need to be addressed with the county. I don't believe in a zero sum game where somebody absolutely has to lose for us to gain. I think there is a way, a creative way to move forward. And that way of moving forward is that as a condition of my support to move forward, I wanna make sure that the funds that this brings in is committed to putting back into the environment. For years, we've been talking about finally creating this quantum eco park, the largest preserve, one of the largest preserves we have in the city. It's about time we make those investments. And I also wanna add that I wanna ensure that we're no longer dependent on parties like Olin, the Russian billionaire. This way we don't have to wait on negotiations from them for another five, 10, 15 years. We can make this quantum park a reality relatively soon. And by making those investments, and I think there's plenty of money to go around, if we strike the right deal, this action, if we do it right, can be not just environmentally neutral, but it could be environmentally positive. In that one move, we can make significant in investments into our parks and also protect the Southern Preserve there south of Gateway, which is significant and whose square footage far exceeds multiple orders of this current property that we're discussing. So those are my conditions. I want a better deal. I know it can be had. I want to have an appraisal that's current. I think that's required by our ordinance. And I want to make sure that moving forward, we make actions that are environmentally positive and we can turn the situation into that. I'll close with that. Thank you, Vice Mayor. Um, my comments uh, kind of echo uh, yourself and uh, Commissioner Hay regarding the appraisal. Um, and, you know, after hearing from our neighbors, um, not necessarily uh, residents of the city of Boynton Beach, but there, there's, there's still residents of Boynton Beach. Um, it kind of puts me in that perspective of is that we're trying to sell preserved, you know, technically preserved land since it hasn't been developed for 50 plus years. Uh, so that we could preserve other land. And I don't think that's a, a fair exchange. Um, and so the, the aspect of it with the, what Centennial mentioned is that we don't own all the property. Uh, the Palm Beach County Housing Authority owns 10 acres to the west of the property south of the canal. It's something that they're putting in an application for HUD to dispose of properties we need to double check to make sure that this is part of that or it's not part of that. Um, and the the aspect of it is, is that we do not have to sell all 14 acres. If we decide we can sell, you know, that area south of the canal and keep that area north of the canal so that we have that seven acres that is still a preserve for that wildlife and other areas that have not been touched uh, by humans. And so that's something that, you know, I think we need to hopefully make that decision in the future. Um, I'm glad that we're, we're making a decision because after reviewing the, the contract, I have not signed it. And so even though I have the authority to sign it, uh, I haven't. So that means we're not in a binding contract with Pulte Homes yet. Um, and I think that's kind of where we need to uh, just reevaluate how do we make it better? It's not a zero sum game where we have to sell it all, but we, if, if we do sell some, we wanna make sure that we are getting the best price for that. And the LOI is not a good model to get the best price because it doesn't uh, create the competition that uh, gives uh, incentive for people to do what the, the best for our residents. So, um, you know, what I would, I guess, Jim, if you could clarify, do we need to reconsider the motion to sell? Um, if we don't want to sell? The, the appropriate motion, as I've outlined in your agenda cover sheet, one of the options is would be a motion to rescind the resolution of approval. 
that would clear the way for you to consider all other options to deal with the property. And so. Mayor. Yes. I just also want to make a, a something clear and, and perhaps the city manager or the city attorney can weigh in on this. Um, regardless of getting the appraisal, which is necessary, um, I do understand that the value that has been proposed by Pulte and both by Centennial are potentially way above whatever the appraised value will be when we get it. So I, I don't believe we are being shortchanged or anything like that. So I just want to make sure that that's very clearly stated because, you know, that land as it sits right now undeveloped is definitely not worth 2.7 or 3 point whatever million dollars. Mayor. Uh, yes. My understanding is that it is a legal requirement for us to have that current appraisal. Staff could weigh in and correct me if I'm mistaken. Uh, no, Vice Mayor, the provision of our code is says no such sale shall be conducted or consummated okay. until such time as the subject property has been appraised. So it, it, that language consummated to me in a, in a real estate transaction means closed. The transaction closes. So there's a window of opportunity for the appraisal that exists now. And, um, and I so hope that answers your question. It, it does, Jim. but. I guess it, it opens another question is how old is too old in terms of this appraisal? It, I mean, I guess it doesn't specify that in the language. Is that right? Um, it does not. It, all it says is it must be a, uh, um, an appraiser designated by the city commission. All and right. The, as my understanding is the 2014 appraisal was not designated that the appraiser was not designated by the commission. Um, but, you know, if there's information that staff has that's contrary to that, you know, I'd like to hear that. Mayor, considering, uh, you know, my understanding is it really doesn't take that much time. Within a, within a few weeks, we can get an update appraisal. Uh, I just want the best deal. And part of that is for me to know the appraised value. Uh, and so at this time, I am going to put forward a motion to rescind that approval so we can move in this direction of obtaining an appraisal, a current appraisal, then we can evaluate whether or not the deal that's in front of us uh, is the best offer. And so Mayor? I'll make that motion. Yes. Oh, I, I apologize, Vice Mayor, I thought you were done talking. I, I was just gonna say, I think the better, okay. if, if I may make a, an alternate motion, it would just be to table this because we haven't executed anything quite yet. So it would just be to table this and let that um, appraisal happen and come back at the second meeting in October and make a decision. And if either party decides that they want to raise their offer price again, then that's up to them. Right. So, uh, Commissioner, are you asking me to amend? Are you are you saying that's your motion? Or did you want me to amend my motion? No, I'm not making a motion since you already have a motion. I'm simply just saying that it, all, it would suffice to just table this. Uh, I, I think I agree. So, um, I'll amend my motion to table uh, pending, uh, we have that uh, appraisal. We've got the lights again. I would second that. All right. So I, I do have a, a question, though. Go ahead. I mean, it, it's 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 kind of FYI for me, but uh, how, this property actually is in the county. How in the world did we end up with it, in the city of Boynton? Uh, was it uh, a gift or what? Uh, how, 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 how did we get here? That's, that's a question we're going to hopefully get answered soon. The, pro okay. the, the property was conveyed to the city. Most of the property was conveyed to the city by the county. Um, I don't recall the year it was either 81 or 72, but quite a long time ago. Oh, that's 19, <laughs> by the way, 19. 72 or 81. I would hope. <laughs> <laughs> Doesn't feel like it. <laughs> <laughs> and 
And so, so, so it, it, it would end up having to be uh, annex if it were developed and we wanted to part of our city is what I'm hearing. Commissioner, hey, can you repeat what you just said? Your microphone went in and out. Uh, it would have to be uh, an a annexation uh, if we down the road if we want to make it part of the city of Boston, uh, assuming that it was and and, and when it's developed. Yeah, but it's not contiguous, so. Yeah, so it, it, that's right. Been, it, would, it would only not. be subject to annexation when it is contiguous with uh, the city of Boynton Beach city limits. Um, so that it's that, that's not something that would happen in conjunction uh, with the, this closing to whoever party it's sold to. Okay. All right. So we have a motion and a second to table um, in regards to. Uh, an appraisal. Jim, is that qualify with me not signing uh, the purchase and sale agreement? Uh, yes, sir. Um, you, you should not sign the agreement while the matter is still pending before the commission. Okay. Um, I do have someone here on the, the podium that has spoken before. Does the commission want her to make a, a brief comment before we end and call a vote? City manager, you have a comment. Does the city commission need to approve of the appraiser appraising company per the ordinance? We had, do yes, I need to the, okay. the commission has to designate the appraiser. Okay, so Colin, it's, who is the, the group we normally use? And if I'll, I'll pose that out to you in order to have it for October 20th. I don't so, know. If it's yes, I, Colin Groff, assistant city manager. Um, the, the, the group would we that we would recommend because they had completed the uh, previous thing is Anderson and Carr Inc. And we do have a proposal from them. They're out of uh, West Palm Beach. Um, and they, 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 they completed the previous one. So it'd be um, less expensive for the city to use them. All right. Your consensus, Jim, or a vote or? Yeah, it should be a vote yes, sure. to approve the designation. So, uh, Vice Mayor, would you like to uh, amend your motion to approve the um, appraiser selected from the city? Yes. Um, so move as amended. And Commissioner Hay, would you like to second that? Yes, I would second that. Okay. And as I mentioned before, uh, does the commission allow me to have someone to, who's at the podium make a brief final comments before we vote? I'm always open to it, Mayor. Okay. I'm open. Yes. Thank you. Thank you very much. And thank you, Mayor, for listening to our voices, listening to our concerns. I appreciate you. State your name and address for the record My again. My name is Laura Milligan. I'm at 3621 Harlow Avenue. And um, <clears throat> I know that I know Pulte has built many, many homes throughout Florida. There's a lot of other properties that could be considered. And money should be the focal point of what is important for this particular property. The property does house endangered species. As it was also mentioned before, a lot of gopher tortoises do not relocate them. And I, my daughter has seen a bald-headed eagle. We're not just making this up. These, these creatures live in our, in, in our forest that should be protected. And this should not be just rubber stamped, just like other properties. This is a very special parcel piece of property, parcel of property. It was mentioned about 10 acres uh, to the west of being owned by Palm Beach Housing Authority. Palm Beach Housing Authority could also build on the property. Then the entire forest will be gone. And it's not like a bad haircut that will grow back. It will never be the same way again. You build houses, it will be gone. My my kids, my grandkids will never have the opportunity along with the rest of us. Um, we're just building too much on our planet. And I've already mentioned about climate change, global warming, and I'm not going to repeat myself at that. But thank you very much for the opportunity to speak. Thank you. All right. Mayor, I, I do have a question before you vote on the motion to yes. table. I assume yes. that the commission wants to make certain that the appraisal is in hand and available to the commission, you know, in advance of uh, the, the, nec the next commission meeting. Um, we would certainly want it a couple of days before I would think uh, the, the distribution or preparation of the agenda. 
so that not only the commission has access to it, but the interested parties and the public have access to it. So although ordinarily when we table it means to the next meeting, um, would, would the maker of the motion consider tabling it until there's sufficient time to distribute the appraisal? Uh, because I have no idea how long it will take to get it. Uh, but you would believe it's uh, by November 3rd or November 4th, or uh, first meeting in uh, November? I, I I don't know. Um, maybe Colin okay. could answer that based upon his discussions of having gotten a quote. Right. We we did talk to them and they gave us an estimate of two to three weeks. So uh, no later than three weeks. So I think the November meeting would be, if that's the choice of the commission, um, would definitely, uh, I think, provide us time uh, to receive it and make sure it's in the agenda item and it's distributed. All right. So. Uh, I believe the, the vice mayor's motion is to table subsequent to uh, appraisal by Anderson and Carr, and that it is to the the time that it is come and available for the the city commission. And uh, I don't I don't think right. we need to redo the that motion, but mm -hmm. I think the I appreciate your comments, Jim, and that we will will have the it uh, for the on the. At the appropriate meeting after the ability to research the the appraisal comes back yes sir and the with the if that if the next agenda rolls around it will be so notated when it's anticipated okay jim uh mayor yes mr hey do, you know, do you know how much time you would need after the appraisal is in your hand in, in terms of getting it out to the people that you need to get it out to? Well, it'll be an immediate turnaround. As soon as we get it, it will be distributed to the commission. I would say to the two interested parties that um, are um, engaged in negotiations in a sense with you, and we could make it available to the public, whoever, whoever wants to make a request for it. Okay. I just want to make sure that you had adequate time. We'll make certain it's not back on your agenda until, you know, we've allowed enough time for everybody that's interested in knowing what the number is, knows what the number is. Good. All right. So any further discussion from the commission? Seeing none, all those in favor state so by saying aye. 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 All those opposed? Hearing none, motion passes unanimously to table until uh, appraisal is done and brought back to the city commission. Thank you. All right, moving on to consent, bids and purchases over 100,000. Motion to approve. Second. Okay. Seeing no further discussion, all those in favor state so by saying aye. 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 All those opposed? Hearing none, motion passes unanimously. Moving on to item 8A. Public hearing, the city commission will conduct these public hearings in its dual capacity as local planning agency and city commission. Jim, would you please read ordinance number 20-31 and 20-32. All right. Um... Ordin uh, an ordinance of the city of Boynton Beach, Florida, amending ordinance 8938 by amending the future land use settlement of the comprehensive plan for property commonly known as Catanzaro residential and described herein, changing land use designation from local retail, local retail commercial to medium density residential, providing for conflict severability and an effective date. All right. May I have a motion to approve? So moved. Second. Thank you. Is there any further comment from the, the commission? Um, John, is there anyone with their hand raised or asking a question? Uh, may I grant not at this time? All right. So, in regards to proposed ordinance number 20 deaths, 
031, may I have a roll call, please? Commissioner Hay? Aye. Commissioner Romulus? Aye. Mayor Grant? Yes. Vice Mayor Conserva? Might mean you need a potty break. <laughs> is he's okay. self muted? So uh, he, he is absent for that vote. Okay. Uh, we'll have we will have to get his um, his vote on that when he returns. Yes. Moving forward, okay. uh, we have a motion to approve on twenty zero three two. Mayor, I don't think I read that one yet. It's an okay. ordinance of the city of Boynton Beach, Florida, amending land. Amending Ordinance 02013 to rezone a parcel of land described here and commonly referred to as the Kenton Zero Residential from C2 Neighborhood Commercial to R3 Multifamily Residential, providing for complex severability and an effective date. All right. Thank you. Do I have a second? Mayor, I apologize. I could take a little personal break. No worries. Um, uh, so uh, your vote is still needed on Ordinance 20-031, approved Contanzaro Residential Future Land Use Map Amendment from local retail commercial to medium density residential. Yes, for the record, my vote is a yes. All right. We are looking for a second on Ordinance 20-032. I will gladly second that. Thank you. I do not see anyone else from the audience or anyone else online that has a comment or has their raise, hand raise. Commissioner Hay, do you have a final comment? You're, you're muted. Your, your microphone's not working right now. All right. Well, we got to figure that out. Um, yeah. Just um, for the record, for Ordinance 20 031, I just needed to call for Commissioner Katz's vote as well and, and call the vote for it. Um, yes. Mr. Katz? Yes, on that vote. Okay. Vote is 5 0. Thank you. Thank you. And thank you, uh, uh, Crystal. Yes. Commissioner Hay, can you use? Speak to let us uh, know your microphone's working. Yes, uh, that's exactly what I was going to say. Uh, we didn't get Commissioner uh, Katz on that last vote. All right. I appreciate it. So we have a motion and second on 20 032. Is there any further comments from the commission? Seeing none, may I have a roll call, please? Commissioner Romer? Aye. Mayor Grant? Yes. Vice Mr. Yes. Commissioner Harris? Yes. Commissioner Hay? Aye. Vote is 5 0. Thank you. Congratulations. Our next item is 8B, um, Ordinance 20 030. May I have a motion to remove from the table? So move. Second. All those in favor, state so by saying aye. 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 All those opposed? Hearing none, motion passes unanimously. Jim, do you mind yes. reading? Ordinance 20030, an ordinance of the City of Boynton Beach, Florida, authorizing the city manager and city clerk to make provisions for public meetings by use of communication media technology and for attendance by use of such technology by elected and appointed officials during periods when the city commission determines and declares a local public health emergency or other circumstances, which the commission determines necessary to protect the health and safety of the citizens, officials, city staff, and the public, providing for this ordinance to control in the event of a conflict with other ordinances, providing for severability, providing an effective date. And I, I know this sounds like uh, or seems like Groundhog Day because you just did this, 
but we did start this this ordinance before we needed to do an emergency ordinance last week. So in your backup, you will see in red, hopefully in red ink, but maybe not, uh, and underlined um, all of the additions to the ordinance for second reading that were contained in the emergency ordinance. So those two documents uh, will conform. They will be exactly the same. Uh, so if you're intending to adopt it, my recommendation would be that you first make a motion to amend it um, as shown in the uh, agenda backup document and then your motion to approve. All right. So do we have a motion to approve? Motion to amend. Yes, it's a motion to amend. All right. I will say. Motion to Do I have a second? Yes, second to amend. All right, thank you. Um, any further comments from the commission? Seeing none, um, may I have a roll call, please? Mayor Grant? Yes. Vice Mayor Pinsarga? Yes. Commissioner Katz? Yes. Commissioner Hay? Aye. Commissioner Ramos? Aye. Vote is 5 0. Thank you, Mayor. I'll do my best not to bring it back again at the next meeting. So it's okay. I know there's a couple of people here in City Hall right now, so we'll, we'll figure enough rooms out. Um, Moving on to items uh, H, C, D, and E. We have a request to table to our next meeting. Motion to approve the table. Second. All right. Um, seeing no further discussion, all those in favor state so by saying aye. 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 All those opposed, hearing none, motion passes unanimously. Uh, I'd like to to speak with the applicant. I uh, have, have not had a chance to really review the the whole aspect of it and see what we can do to get more commercial space in there, if possible. Um, moving forward to the city manager's report, update on regulations available funds for plant memorial fund. John, can you unmute Mara? And she'll provide a. a brief report on the fund and its balance and what you may and may not do with the funds that are in there okay uh mara you have unmuted good evening mayor and commissioners mara Fredrickson, director of financial services um currently in our city plant memorial fund there is seven thousand two hundred and thirty three dollars this fund was established in 2000 the year 2000 with initial donation of fifteen hundred dollars um, the fund is currently funded based on donations from residents when they feel fit. The last sizable donation that we had was in 2015 in the amount of $16,770. Um, and currently the donations must be spent on tree or plant beautification within the city limits and all standard procurement regs must be followed when using the fund. So... I mean, so I understand that this may have been used as part of our um, Tree City USA funds to plant trees. Um, and so, you know, for me, I just uh, lost my cat Milo and I passed, Daisy passed away. So, you know, I'd like to put in some funds. And is it possible if within the city commission to create a policy to pick uh, which park a new tree would go would be planted? Um, and that we pick the amount of money per tree. You know, I would suggest either 50 or $100 per tree so that the, the fund can grow and that more trees could be planted within the city. So. Mayor. Yeah. Could you just clarify on the request? So. I don't want them, someone to be able to put a dollar 
into the Memorial Tree Fund, I want to have basically a minimum amount of 50 or $100. I see. And that way, um, someone can specify an area in a city park that they would like to, uh, or median or basically have the availability of trees to be planted so that we can further expedite our tree canopy within the, the city parks and uh, land. Mayor, I, I like your idea. And I think with that option, people are more likely to donate if they had a say. Uh, my only concern is that I'm not sure if that would work on a practical level. For example, if somebody had donated $100 for this tree to be placed in this median, I mean, it wouldn't work because it would just be one tree in the median. We might have to wait until sufficient funds have accrued for an actual project. Does that make sense? That makes absolute sense. And so that's kind of where, you know, we deal with our cemetery all the time, where we have the, the plat and then the amount of people uh, that go. And so that's something that hopefully our, we can move forward with our parks and recs department to say, you know, which areas can use the trees immediately or how much money is needed to fulfill a certain space before we move forward with the yeah. project. So uh, basically we're kind of giving a uh, direction to our city to help further expedite our tree canopy study to say, um, if someone would like to make a, a donation available in a certain location to, to start with that process. I would support that. Commissioner Hay? Uh, I, I wanna make sure I understand but let me just state my position. I, I, okay. I support the idea of designating and, and, and coming up with $100. But certainly, if I got, if you have people out there that got, that has $25 or $50, they should be able to donate those monies. I, I would like to say that if they're going to designate, then the minimum amount would be a certain, like the $100 you're talking about. But don't mm -hmm. cut off the ones who, don't have the hundred dollars, but they want to contribute because I think volume wise, we would end up getting more funds of, of $50 or $25 than we would a uh, hundred dollars designated to a certain area. And right. Yes, Lori. Um, I, you know, we've, in fact, we just received a donation not too long ago, we planted a tree in honor of a, a resident's father. Um, we work very closely with the donors when they come in and I, I would I'd caution you on having them be able to say specifically where they want the tree versus uh, no, no, utilizing no, perhaps is, our tree canopy guy. No, so basically you know. what we're saying is that we're telling people where they can plant the tree, not the other way around. The city is telling people where they could plant trees if they so desire or if they just want to put money into the Memorial Tree Fund uh, okay, that's what we're doing now. That's so, really so, much. So yeah, that that's kind of it. Is that if we could, you know, basically with Commissioner Hay saying, hey, you know, for a certain amount of money, these are the available spots that you could plant. However, if you don't have that certain amount of money and you'd like to donate to get a recognition for your loved one, you can make another donation and. Um, you know, I don't think it would hurt if we print out a little certificate. I know we print out lots of proclamations so that if someone makes a donation of $25 or more, we can give them a certificate uh, of, of the funds that they donated. Yeah, just historically, anybody, any amount they've donated, we've managed to work out what the what an appropriate plant in that price range would be. And, you know, if so we'll always work with them to, to make okay. something realized for them. I just want you to understand that, that that's something we take very seriously and, and know it's very okay. meaningful to people. So we're doing that now. All right, thank you. So who do, so I guess the big question is, is who, do, who does a, a resident contact in the city to move forward with uh, give, donating to this fund? Um, so right. we, go ahead. Oh, Laura, sorry. I'm sorry. I forgot you were there. <laughs> um, we work with, we'll typically connect them with Matt Doyle, who is our landscape architect. 
and that's what he just did with the one resident we, we actually located a bench and i believe a tree also but um you know in a place that they desired we work out the location with them and so he, he's recreation and parks or matt doyle or city it doesn't matter we get we get them to matt so they can okay. call our office even so th that's that's kind of it i'd like to you know whether it be the the front desk or and I call our main number the, the six thousand number and we'll get them okay. to the appropriate person so the five you know if someone wants to make a donation five six one seven four two six thousand would be the number to call yep. perfect all right well Minor there. yes i just wanted to thank you for this proposal because it reminds me of pbs if you think about what pbs does <laughs> Yeah. They actually offer something like what you described, right? You reach this threshold for $50, you get this recognition and for $100 and so forth. So if it drives their fundraising, and I think this would definitely drive fundraising as well. Yeah. I think it's a great idea. Excellent. And I'm glad we can uh, bring this to light because, yeah, I did, you know, when Casey got uh, moved up, he just found out about it. So. It's yeah. it's fun that we're we're finding all different ways to help with the the tree canopy. All right, uh, so we we thank you, Lori. We're moving on to item nine B. If there's no further comments, city staff to provide the commission with an update on the status of the art and public places program, including the kinetic art exhibit, the recruitment for public arts manager, and the mural installation at fire station one. John, if Catherine uh, is muted, if you'll unmute her, please. She will provide the update. Good evening, Mayor and Commissioners. This is Catherine Maxwell, Assistant City Manager. Um, we have, in terms of the kinetic event, um, we have made some really good progress. Uh, Valerie and her business partner, Nicole Lewis, have done a really excellent job of hitting the ground running. And I want to turn it over to Nicole Lewis, who's actually on the call. Um, to provide some updates on the kinetic event. The biggest one of which is where we moved the date from February to March. It's now March 6th and 7th, um, just to allow us that extra month of time while it's still hopefully in good weather um, for the event. So, Nicole? I'm Catherine, I've unmuted Nicole, but she is also self-muted. So Nicole Lewis, if you could unmute your, there you go. Hello, hi, good evening, everyone. Uh, my name is Nicole Lewis with Zucca Loris Media Group, and we're excited to share that we have almost all of the art pads filled, and we're just waiting for a few more artists to respond and the remaining ones. As far as securing artists for the indoor exhibit, everything is moving along very well. Um, and we are also in the process of receiving proposals for food, beverage, and entertainment for the weekend. Um, we sent out the initial press release, which was distributed a few weeks ago. We've gotten picked up a couple of places. Uh, we've also um, sent out the first initial social media post for calling all artists, and it was posted on the city's uh, social media pages as well. So if anyone has any questions, um, you can go ahead. So my quick question is regarding um, the proposal for uh, vendors and food trucks. Um, have you reached out to the CRA uh, to get their list of different restaurants that are available so that we could uh, hopefully use uh, the local restaurants as well? I believe that um, the art board is working on that and we have a list of all of the restaurants in the area and yes, we are reaching out to them as well. Okay, thank you. You're welcome. Any more questions? Not seeing any. And so, okay. Lori, did you need a approval of the, the uh, no. mural for Fire Station One? Well, that's yeah. Catherine still wanted to. I don't. I think she just wanted to let you know where we were on the recruitment, and then okay. uh, we do want an approval, yes, on the mural. Okay. So um, on your with the, I'm sorry. With the public art manager recruitment, we had made a verbal offer to a candidate and they were going through the process with HR and unfortunately they were offered, well, fortunately for them, unfortunately for us, they were offered um, a better offer that they wrote in the, specifically in the email that we would not be able to counter offer. 
um, from one of their current clients. So unfortunately, we are back to this, the uh, beginning. The, the position has been posted on the city website for a couple of weeks now. I think it has about another week. Um, and then we will start reviewing the candidates and go from there. I also want to give a, a quick shout out to Nicole Blanks. She's our public art assistant, and she has done a really fantastic job filling in. Um, she's been excellent with the communication, um, excellent with dealing with the board, the art board, um, and helping us continue the installations of the art at the in the town square area, including in the first floor lobby and the second floor lobby of City Hall, um, and the police, the piece that went in at the police station. Um, and the various pieces around. So she's really done an excellent job of filling in in the meantime. So I just wanted to um, acknowledge that publicly. Um, and then the last item is the um, the mural that we, for the um, fire station one, we have, to give you an update on that, we received 14 responses. When all was said and done after the second round of letters, I only got one additional response. So we had 13 after sending the second letter that made it 14 responses. Um, and one of them was requesting not to be um, in the mural. So we are basically tonight bringing you back the mural um, with the one person that doesn't wanna be in it removed. Everything else is exactly the same as it was originally supposed to go up before those alterations were made back in June. And um, we wanted to basically get your approval tonight on Based fabricating and, and putting up the, the mural. Um, John. John. Yeah, John, can you put up the, the picture in the backup? John, if you don't have it in the folder, I just sent you an email. I don't know if you're able to access your email to pull it up. It should be. It's in the backup to the agenda item, yes. It was in the agenda backup too. So this is the original as it was originally designed. So I'll give you a minute and then we'll scroll to the next one. So the, if you focus on the middle panel, the one, the picture with the check, that's our former chief Joseph and he had requested not to be in the mural. So when we show you the, the next version, he's removed and that's the only change. As you can see, can you removed. zoom in a little bit? Actually, I, I we have it. I believe he was in this area here. If you can see where the pointer. Yes, thank you. I will scroll back up to the. Yes. So the Oops. Oops. Sorry. So here's the original, the very, very original. Chief Joseph pictured, and then when you scroll down, he's removed per his request that we have in writing. May I have a motion to approve? Option two. So moved. Thank you. Do I have a second? Anyone from the commission? Second. Thank you. Seeing no further comments, all those in favor state so by saying aye. Aye. Any opposed? Hearing none, motion passes unanimously. Thank you. So when we unveil, when we reinstall the mural and unveil it, we will have a, a nice unveiling event. Obviously, it'll be socially distanced and appropriate for the pandemic that we're still facing. But we want to um, 
we'll we'll send out an invitation list and have a nice event for for the commission and the community to um, honor the, the mural going back up. Thank you, Catherine. Thank you. Our next item is 9C, City Staff to request City Commission to schedule a workshop to discuss revisions to workforce housing ordinance. Um, Thank you, Mayor. Colin's going to present this item. We've, we've spoken to each of you individually and the, you know, the struggles and the, the need to take a, a real good hard look at our workforce and affordable housing ordinance. And we, we really request that we have some time outside of a regular commission meeting, perhaps in a workshop, to spend a couple hours, if not a few hours, um, to really talk about the vision and the goal of where we're headed as a, a city and what you what you desire. Um, there are many things we can do. It's confusing to throw all these things out at you and try to do that in the middle of a commission meeting. So we're going to request your consideration of a workshop, perhaps in November or early December. And then Colin wants to discuss a, a couple of revisions we would like to move forward on relatively quickly. Colin, if you wanna go ahead and show that, and then we could come back with you with potential dates on the workshop if you're amenable to that idea. So yes, um, Colin Groff, assistant city manager. You know, you, you, uh, the commission has asked us uh, several times to, to look into the workforce housing. We've brought back a couple of minor revisions over the last year. Um, and so we've had a team working on it. And as Lori said, it, there is a lot of ideas out there and, and to really move forward. And John, if you can bring up the presentation real quick, that would be great, um, or, at, or Alan. Anyways, um, to move forward, what we really found out is, is we really need some, some we really need your help <laughs> is really what we need. So a workshop is what we're asking for. Um, the other thing we started looking at is while we were looking at the workforce housing and the affordable housing ordinance, we also, found some other things in our ordinances that might actually help produce the housing stock that we need that fits in those guidelines. So, John, you can go to the second slide um, real quick. Um, so what we would like to do today is just ask for some consensus if you would like us to bring some of these ideas back very quickly because there's some projects coming up that might be able to take advantage of this and actually provide um, um, units that will be well within the affordable and workforce housing uh, range. And uh, so the first one real quick is, is uh, there's a couple of counties, Martin County is one, City of Sarasota is one, and, and we're finding some others that in their downtown areas to encourage uh, smaller units to be built, which by clearly by definition, they're smaller, they're gonna be less expensive um, and, and more in that range that people can afford, um, that they do, they count them as a half a unit for density only. So they still have to meet all the other requirements, all the other codes, all the parking codes, anything else. But you know, they for density, um, they 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 count as a half a unit. And uh, the, the the places we've looked have been very very successful with this of creating uh, uh, housing stock that uh, that fits in that price range that we really need in the city uh, for those young people coming in that need a place to live. Uh, you know, for maybe retirees, um, um, single parents. Uh, they don't need a lot of space. Uh, they just need something that's affordable, that's nice. Um, so that's the first one. And the second one we've started looking at is something that I think it's been on a future agenda uh, list a couple of times is, is we'll allow accessory dwelling units um, in certain neighborhoods, uh, of course, with regulations that ensure the compatibility within the neighborhood. And what this does is allow somebody who has maybe the room on their lot and they'd like to build a secondary structure on their single family residential lot that fits within the neighborhood. Of course, it has to meet all the rules and fit. Um, it again provides um, you know, that, that additional housing stock uh, for maybe it's uh, one of their kids, maybe it's their, their in-laws or their, their parents, or, or maybe it is just a rental for, for somebody. Um, so those are two ideas that we've had that we'd like to, if there's consensus from the commission to write, to bring some of these back, we'd like to, a consensus to move forward to write some regulations around these and bring them back to you uh, for consideration um, while we're waiting on doing a workshop to address the overall workforce housing ordinance and trying to make that a very powerful ordinance for the city to really provide uh, a lot of um, a housing stock in the affordable and workforce housing area. So with that, that's what we're looking for is, is both a workshop and uh, some consensus if, we, if, you, if you want to bring these forward. Yeah, I'll 
I'll start off with uh, I'm in favor of both of these, um, but one of the things in regards to item two, uh, I saw that because of the virtual meetings to have it not necessarily be a dwelling unit, but and not necessarily a shed, but it's kind of like a mini office room. And so, you know, that would add a lot of, uh, that would add property value to the city of Boynton Beach. And I think that's something that we want to, you know, differentiate between a dwelling unit and a shed and somewhere in between. Yeah, absolutely. I, I think those are some of the other benefits of, of an ordinance like this, a change like this, that uh, it actually opens up some possibilities. And again, the key to the regulations is making sure that they're compatible with the neighborhoods. It's not just something thrown in. It's it's very compatible. So it doesn't impact the neighbors uh, when you do something. It, it, it just adds, it just enhances the value. And so does uh, anyone else from the commission have any comments? I support this. Thank you. And do we have a no or yes for the other three commissioners? Of course, Sorry. yes. Okay, thank you. All right, so we, we, we do have a consensus to move forward with these two items uh, on a more expedited basis versus the, the workforce housing workshop. I have a question. Yes, Commissioner Romulus. Um, in, in the interim of rewriting or improving the ordinance does that put us in a place where applicants could potentially come in and we miss out on anything or are we leaving ourselves that's a, yeah that's a great question i think um if we have any applicants come in of course remember our applicants for these types of developments that will provide these there it's a longer term so if there's some things that we know we're working on we could let the applicant know that um, and we can encourage them to move that way. And then you, if, if a site plan comes to you and we already know, you know, we're going to do a workshop fairly quickly, you know, end of November, beginning of December, we can let them know some things are coming and build it into either if a site plan approval is there, you build it into that approval as a condition of approval. But yeah, absolutely, we don't want to miss any opportunities to provide this kind of housing. So uh, I think, you know, we definitely work with applicants as long as we know where the city and you know, where the commission wants to go. Okay. This is Jim. Let, let me jump in with a slightly different point of view to remind the commission that an applicant is bound by the provisions of the code that are in place when they file their application. So you may be fortunate enough to have the cooperation of an applicant um, that would conform to whatever you're evolving to in the code. But correspondingly, you may have an applicant that insists that they are only bound by the provisions of the code in place when they made their application. So right. um, obviously time is, is of great importance in reaching the amendments that um, at some point the commission wants to adopt. Yeah, so from the workshop, um, Colin, how much longer until after that to put these in the form of an ordinance that would then come before us for approval? Um, it is one of our uh, top priorities. So, really, it depends on the on the guidance that we receive from the workshop. But most of the ideas that staff have that we would like to bring up and make sure it's fitting with the commission's goals would be done because we've already done a lot of the work. So it'd be very very quickly to bring it back, um, uh, building on what we already have. And again, I I I agree with Jim. Yes, they're bound. You know, if an applicant comes in right now, they're they can be bound by the current rules. We would encourage them. If the, if the new rules added some things that helped them, I think we could encourage them to uh, go above and beyond the current rules. And that's what we do as staff. Uh, that's, and again, they're and not required to, but it's what we try to do. And Jim, you know, even though um, the governor's uh, work uh, ordinance may expire at the end of October, would our virtual ordinance allow for this type of workshop to be virtually? Yes, Mayor. Uh, the way we drafted it was to exercise municipal home rule, which is not dependent upon what the governor does or does not do. So our or, the ordinance you just adopted and the emergency ordinance last week allows you to continue to meet by um, 
virtually until December the 31st, and thereafter only by extension by commission vote. So um, I think we have consensus to move forward and that uh, with, you know, I'd like to see about getting a date now uh, regarding the second or third week of November, preferably the second week, so that hopefully we can get something in front of our P&D board on the, the 24th versus um, in December. So if we, the 11th or 12th, Yeah, we will work with our, we'll work with our administrative staff to get with you and, and get with all the commissioners and, and find a date as soon as we can that uh, everybody can attend. All right, well. And I think we'll, we will meet, we will probably schedule it for about two hours, maybe it could go faster. Um, and it'll be interactive, uh, it'll be an interactive workshop where staff will have uh, presentation material to go through. All right. So I know the was it the the twelfth and thirteenth is the Florida League of Cities, um, but because it's virtual, I would say that November twelfth uh, that evening might work out best because the eleventh is Veterans Day. That works for everybody else. We can go ahead and try to set that date. Uh, That's fine. fine for me personally. All right. We will work on getting that date out. All right. Excellent. Thank you, Mayor. All right. Now we move on. Unless there's any further discussion for the workforce housing, we're going to move to uh, police transparency, uh, the new website, if we have any comments in regards to that. So I sent out the chief uh, and Stephanie, they have really done an amazing job putting all of our policies and documents and training and everything we do with our with our officers uh, on a very accessible, easy to, to see website. And I shared that with you during the week because I thought it was awesome. So uh, if you'd like uh, Commissioner Romulus, we can have the chief brag on that for a minute. And uh, yes. he has also another announcement to make um, regarding his selection of a deputy Police chief. Yes, that's that would be great. Good evening, Commissioners. Mayor Michael Gregory, Police Chief. Can you hear me? Yes, we can. Very good. Uh, well, yes, as uh, C Manager just uh, noticed, I've been very excited about the this new uh, web page that we've been able to uh, post. Uh, as I've participated in a number of community meetings on Zoom and uh, discussions about police reform and what's going on in society with policing and democracy. There's always questions about, well, what are your policies and what kind of training do you provide your officers? And are our officers trained in fair and partial policing or what do we give them as far as de-escalation? And it's a, a constant theme through the different panels that I sit on. So I thought it would be a great idea just to consolidate that information in one web page that's easily accessible to folks. We can uh, direct them, uh, 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 those who are inquisitive about this type of stuff to that page where they can work on their own college students as well as uh, social activists and the rest can all easily see and uh, and then fall in line with what we've been trying to uh, model as an agency and that's as uh, police transparency so that uh, everyone can see how we operate what we do the ideas we come up with and and this will continue to grow and evolve over time so again I'm very excited I appreciate the opportunity to, to share it with you and uh, we'll uh, will respond to any questions you may have Uh, does the commission have any questions regarding the website? I think no our question. just a comment. Yes. I just want to, you know, thank our chief and and Stephanie Slater as well, along with the rest of our police department for their continued work to maintain transparency, especially in the heightened nature of our country at this time. So I, I think it's important and it's prudent that they're doing this. They're staying on top of it. They're continuing to be transparent and forthcoming with the public. This is what we need to see on all levels of government. And um, this is this is appreciated. So thank you. Thank you. Thank you. And, and definitely, uh, I'd have to give kudos to uh, Stephanie Slater. She's the artist and the architect behind the, the web, web stuff with our vendor. 
And uh, that's definitely not my area of expertise, but uh, she, she's really been able to put together a lot of good things to help uh, market and brand our police departments in a positive light. So uh, I'll, I'll just transition real quick to the second uh, uh, topic that the city manager introduced. And that is that as a part of uh, the new budget starting in October 1, we were able to reclassify one of our existing positions. That is, uh, we had three police, assistant police chiefs in the organization uh, in our budget before. Uh, we had one of our assistant chiefs retire a while back, and that position had been vacant. I, I did a, a review and an assessment of what would best fit our organization and be the best benefit to us moving forward to try to implement the programs we want and, and the accountability we want throughout the organization. And I, I decided the best way to do that would be to create a deputy, a deputy police chief's position. Uh, so that uh, has been uh, modified and enrolled out in the new budget this year, uh, transitioning our assistant police chief position to a deputy police chief's position. And I'm very proud to announce that uh, as our first uh, uh, person to, to sit in that position, I've, I've selected Assistant Chief Vanessa Snow to be the interim deputy chief uh, to start with here in that role. I'll just share with you that uh, Chief Snow uh, has been the commander of the Support Services Bureau at the Boynton Beach Police Department. Uh, in that capacity, she oversees the investigative division and high liability functions of the department. Uh, during her 23-year career, she has developed her skills working at the municipal, county, and federal levels. She earned her undergraduate degree from the University of Florida and her Juris Doctorate from Nova Southeastern University. Vanessa has also been trained as an FBI intelligence analyst uh, who, during her time with the FBI, uh, the West Palm Beach office specialized in domestic terrorism and sovereign citizen activity. Uh, she remains proficient uh, in this knowledge and up to the COVID era, she, used, she would travel uh, around the country instructing police agencies and government organizations about these topics. We're really proud of her experience in this field and that combined with her day-to-day uh, -day tenacity and expertise and, 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 and executing tasks around the police department and, and, and supporting the vision I have of where we want to go and the culture we want to create. I'm really proud to be able to uh, announce her as our interim deputy police chief. All right, congratulations. Congrats. And Thank you. I do Thank believe you. Uh, Deputy Chief Interim De is there. Uh, would you like to make a few comments? Sure. Good evening, Mayor Grant and Commissioners. Vanessa Snow, Interim Deputy Police Chief speaking. I'd just like to take a moment to thank Chief Gregory and Chief Manager Laveri for providing me with this opportunity. I'm very excited. And I look forward to working with you to enhance the safety and stability of our community. And on another note, I would also like to extend a sincere welcome to our new Deputy Fire Chief, who I suspect will be announced in the near future. And I look forward to working with him. Thank you so much. Thank you. And so, yes, we have a new Deputy Fire Chief. Can we make his announcement as well? Yes, Chief Carter is going to provide just a brief bio, uh, bio on uh, Deputy Chief of Operations, Hugh Bruder. He's been with us for about five, six weeks now. Um, we wanted to just formally introduce you and let him have a second to say hello. Okay, thank you. Can you hear me all right? Everybody yes, hear me? Okay, thank you, Mayor, Commission, uh, again, citizens of the city. Um, thank you for the opportunity to do something I should have done, probably done five weeks ago, and that's introduce uh, Deputy Chief Hugh Bruder, who is our Deputy Chief of Operations, which is the Emergency Response Division of the department. Um, he comes to us with uh, over 35 years of fire rescue service experience, including his time in the military as a member of the United States Air Force. Uh, he spent 27 years with Miami-Dade County Fire Rescue Department, uh, 10 of those 27 years uh, in positions of higher and mid-level management responsibilities as a chief officer uh, in overseeing divisions, overseeing battalions, and also as a chief fire officer working on staffing protocols and things of that nature. But he brings an additional value to the department with his uh, significant input and significant time where he's become a well-credentialed professional and expert in the field of mental health 
for first responders and military personnel. For the last 10 years, he's worked very closely in treating these first responders, military personnel uh, with such issues as PTSD, severe depression, and uh, uh, again, substance abuse. So he brings a, certainly a, an additional value to the department with respect to the health and wellness of our department and our personnel. So uh, Hugh, are you on? Are you there? He is there. He is uh, self-muted right now. So Hugh, if you can hear us, there you go. I believe I'm unmuted. Good evening, everyone. Uh, Chief, thank you so much for that very nice statement about my wow. career. It has been just an absolute joy to be of service. Uh, it's been almost 40 years of living a life of service, and I take that very, very seriously. So I'm super excited to be here. I think that uh, the last almost six weeks has been absolutely wonderful. What a great bunch of staff, uh, city manager, Mr. Mayor, all the commissioners, uh, citizens of, of Boynton Beach. I uh, just want you to know that I'm here to uh, help improve our department, every other department within the city, uh, work together with all of you to make us the best we can be and make us a model for other departments across the country, especially with our mental health. So thank you very much. I'm honored to be here and uh, looking forward to just do some amazing work with every one of you. All right. Thank you. Thank you, Mayor. And I, I think that's it, Lori, for your reports. Just the transportation to the polls item real quick. So that's a uh, new business item 11A. Oh, I thought we made it E under that. Sorry about that. No worries. Okay. I think that's, um, so oh, wait, but do you that. mind presenting on it for the new business? Yes, I can speak very quickly on this. Um, had a thought the other day of, of seeing, you know, if it would be okay for the city to utilize uh, perhaps some of our recreation buses to assist our residents who may have a need to in transportation to get to the polls for early voting. I asked the uh, city attorney if that was something we would be permitted to do legally, and he said Abs absolutely. Um, pending the commission saying it's okay to utilize city resources, which would be um, Monday through Friday during the week of early voting, which is October 19 through November 1. Then as I'm throwing this idea at its staff, they brilliantly said, we have a contract and a transportation uh, arrangement with Mae Volan. Why don't we talk to them about perhaps doing that for us or helping us out? So we've done that. Casey has reached out. They're thrilled. Uh, we're working on the schedule now, but we will be able to, uh, for the five business days of those two weeks, uh, for transportation for um, any of our residents to get to the Hester Center for early voting, free of charge, special accommodation for those who may need it, wheelchair access, and so forth. And I'm just uh, thrilled, if, uh, assuming you're okay with it, that we can um, offer that to our community uh, to help out should there be a need. Yes, Mayor. Vice Mayor. I 100% am okay with it. It's a fantastic idea. Uh, Lori, I do have a question in terms of logistics. Uh, how exactly would it work? And is it something that I can call the city and say, you know, I'm available at this time. Can you swim by my general community? If not exactly my house, but maybe the clubhouse. Is that how you're planning to do this? Or are we going to have predetermined routes and then people are there or not there? What's the, what's the plan? So we're we're still working on it with May Bolin. They're going to actually do be the call center. So once we finalize um, days and times of when we're going to make it available, uh, like they're going to actually run two times in a day, Monday, Wednesday, Friday. They're looking at they'll do mornings, they'll do uh, afternoons. I want us to augment perhaps the Tuesday and Thursday so it's available five days a week. Um, right now, May Bolin said they'll accept the call to be able to. Um, create routes as the calls come in and kind of assign people days or if someone says oh i can't go that day i need tomorrow because i have a doctor appointment we're going to be able to work it out but we still have logistics to finalize but um the resource is there and um what we think we will be able to meet capacity um should there be a a, a, a great need for it i think we'll between may volan and us we'll be able to handle it so i will um, be coming back to you on october 20 with um, more details uh, of exactly how it probably sooner actually I'll email you all once um we're still okay. finalizing it. 
That's fantastic. Yeah, we're excited. We're excited. And that's it, Mayor. Thank you. Uh, I'll take a, a motion, Vice Mayor. Uh, motion to accept this. Uh, what exactly is it? This agreement. Okay, we're approving. Transportation uh, to the polls. Yeah. Okay. We're approving our contract with Mayville and, and uh, Parks and Recs um, to provide um, early voting to residents uh, within the city limits of Boynton Beach. So this does not apply to the areas with the outside of the city limits uh, for uh, pickup and drop off at the Ezel Hester early voting site. So move all of that. Do I have a second? Second. Thank you. Seeing no further discussion, all of those in favor state so by saying aye. Aye. No, aye. All those opposed? Hearing none, motion passes unanimously. Um, our next item, I believe, is 12A which will be our last item for the evening. Uh, question, okay. question for legal real quick. Is, does legal advise taking this off the table and proceeding? No, I think it should stay on the table. I think it will return to you um, in conjunction with your next significant discussions regarding uh, the Town Square project and our agreements and disagreements with JKM. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. All right. Do we, uh, seeing no one would like to remove this from the table. Uh, anything for future agenda? I know, um, Christina, you said you had the, the ordinance regarding no styrofoam within uh, city um, buildings. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah, I thought, I thought we did some other thing else regarding plastics within the no certain types of plastics within the city. So we'll bring that back to you. We'll we'll update you on that the next meeting yeah. mayor on what we did cuz I need a refresher. Okay. And then um also for uh before we leave Commissioner Romulus and Commissioner Katz, uh your your mail is backing up here. Um do you need uh me to drop it off for you guys? <laughs> I'll I'll swing by tomorrow and pick all that up. I'll swing by tomorrow too. <laughs> yeah, it's uh oh, it's substantial. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> I didn't know so, we were adding another uh, job responsibility to your duties, Mayor. No worries. I'm I'm here. So. <laughs> but uh, if no further comments, uh, may I have a motion to adjourn. So I'll moved. Second. John, would you provide us with a closing? Yes, sir. As a reminder, a recorded version of this session will be posted to the City of Boynton Beach's YouTube channel. <laughs> Links to that channel are available on the City of Boynton Beach's website at boynton-beach.org. This concludes today's meeting. On behalf of Mayor Grant and all of our elected officials, the City Manager and City Staff, thank you for attending today's City of Boynton Beach Commission meeting. Be safe and have a great evening. Bye. Good night, everybody. Bye, Bye everybody.